I've been sober 19 years, 11 months, and nine days as of today. Mm -hmm. And so th I've had a lot of time to talk about this and think about this shit. The term drug of choice would imply that I chose, that I made a conscious decision about what drug I want right. to be the one. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I would not and did not choose crystal meth. So when on Easter Sunday of 1995, April whatever, uh, I got a phone call, and it was 1995, so I didn't have a cell phone, and I'd been gone all day, and I'm sitting there playing like Sega Genesis, like NBA uh, All Star. Hell yeah! It was like when they first moved it to like a, a kind of angled 3D right. kind of feel, and my girl answered the phone. She comes down the corner, you know, with the cable with the cord on the phone and shit, and she's like, "Hey, uh, is a call for you." Now, I was fully aware that my friend John Faunastock, we called him Tumor, he had moved out to Santa Barbara to start playing with his band out there that he had connected with through Shannon Larkin, who currently plays for Godsmack, but was in the band Ugly Kid Joe at the time, but was our friend who we were in a side project with before he moved out there called Motherfucking Pitbulls. And he was also in a band called Wrathchild America. Slash souls at zero. It's a lot of stuff. There. <laughs> it's a lot, a lot to digest. <laughs> you got it. You guys follow me. You got me. You follow me. Right. And so I was aware that he went out there, and those dudes actually, actually, those dudes, Shannon and and John had told me over Christmas, like, hey man, have your shit together, like, because you might get the call, like, to cut to move to California to to join Snot. Where were we at then? I was in Virginia, so I grew, oh, okay. I, I grew up in Virginia. Okay. Yeah, and so um, that's the backstory that I just put after the front story um but yeah so i'm sitting there and i and my girl's all hey here's the phone's for you hello and this guy goes sonny man i've been trying to get a hold of you all day and i said well who is this and he goes this is lynn from snot and i said well what do you want and he goes i want metal and i said you called the right place i want the mayhem bro i want to love the mayhem but he goes i want metal i said you called the right place and he made this sound from his voice through the phone that i heard later on albums it was like yeah <laughs> like when i answered the, you called the right place yeah. he's like man we want you to come join our band and, all, and i was like all right let's uh let's talk about it i didn't say yes right away but in my mind i was like hell yeah i'm going to santa barbara i'm not staying in reston virginia yeah, yeah working yeah. at an animal hospital trying to get another band together and try to make some shit happen in DC. Like, you know, right. lots of bands have done it, but I was like, man, I want to get the hell out of here. And so the phone, they were at a phone booth. And uh, so it was a singer and then Mikey, the guitar player, and then the drummer Brent. And then it finally got to the guy I actually knew, Tumor, John. I went on the phone he's like, yeah, man, we want you to come out. And I'm like, cool. I'm like, what's up with that name, dude? What's up with Snot? And he goes, well, man, we've been in meetings with, you know, a lawyer and some managers and stuff. and." Nobody said anything about it. Nobody's been like, well, you should change the name. <laughs> so he goes, so we're just, and I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, <not a> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> then I came to realize later that the inspiration, one might say, and I don't know if Mikey, I don't know if I ever, if I ever talked to Mikey Dolan about this, but it felt like, or feels like, Mikey was really good friends, is really good friends with the guys in Ugly Kid Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how <laughs> Shannon met Mikey, because right, right, right. Shannon joined Ugly Kid Joe in 1994, and so on. And so um, Mikey was good friends with those guys, so kind of had the idea of like the what they were doing, what Ugly Kid Joe was doing was um, funky. It was kind of like what my friend Whit Crane, the singer from Ugly Kid Joe, says now. At that time, they were the last smile to get through the door. 1991, 92, 93 mm -hmm. started coming, and then grunge hit, and then everyone was like, rave man, you know, and it was beautiful, yeah, but, yeah. Right. but he's like, Ugly Kid Joe's the last smile to get through the door, because then it was, but then Chili Pepper stuck around, Faith No More, stuff like that. But, um, so Ugly Kid Joe had this thing, it was like, kind of like, fuck you, <laughs> but Snot was like, fuck you, man, like, and that's Lynn Strait, dude, but Mikey had the idea. And so I feel like it was kind of inspired by the vibe of Ugly Kid Joe. So where Ugly Kid Joe, uh, was like the little brother of whatever, of Pretty Boy Floyd. <laughs> we were the little brother of Ugly Kid Joe. So like you have a misbehaving child, or like a misbehaving child, and then you have the little brother of the misbehaving that's even worse than the other one. That was us. <laughs> we were even worse. I mean, Lin and Lynn Stray lived that shit until the moment he died. Yeah. 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 He was a fucking was... maniac, man. Oh, I know. I remember when when he passed. That he was... lived the madness, bro. Yeah. Yeah. 
a little Bing. too much. <laughs> Sponsor. You're supposed to live your brand. You are. He was living the brand. He lived bro. the brand. So God bless him, man. Were you still uh, uh, in your addiction at that time? Oh my then? God, yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it wasn't. There wasn't any thought mm-hmm. about it when it, when all that was going on. Was any thought like, about what? Like, I, I'm, I'm. This is normal for me. That everybody's using. Everybody, you know. This is just the normal rock metal lifestyle. Yeah. Your lifestyle. Yeah, I was progressing at that point. I was getting. It was progressing. The mm-hmm. disease, as we call it, uh, in the twelve step realm. <laughs> it was like when Lynn died, especially. It fueled even more justification for self destruction. Mm-hmm. Really. It, it definitely. I went. I, I, I like went in. I feel like it can go one way or the other. Mm. It could be one way like, fuck, okay, wake up, call, I'm not doing this anymore. Right. Or just, fuck it, self-destruct, yeah. three, two, one, blast off. Yeah, right. dude, and I think it depends on where someone is mm-hmm. at the time that the thing happens. Mm-hmm. So where I was at that time, so imagine this, I mean, we're. I got a lot of, I, there's, I have so much like experience that I'm aware of, that I can remember these things, and right. I go, wow, ting, ting, ting. But I had moved to California, and I really delved into addiction, man. I, I, I was, I'm powerless over drugs and alcohol. Once it's in my body, I'm not in control. Maybe I won't go on to the bitter end. Maybe I will, but it's not my choice. Um, sometimes I would stop because the shit would get a little whatever. But then eventually, if I wasn't, you know, I, I really, I'm a 12-step guy, and if I wasn't treating the spiritual aspect right. of me, then I was going to reach for it. If I didn't have something else to help me, go through life, um, I was gonna reach for the drug or the drink, mm-hmm. and it was only a matter of time. And so when I got out to California, when I got to Santa Barbara, it was like paradise, man. Mm-hmm. Santa Barbara was a, like a, there's a college there. Yeah, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Beautiful, every day is like Groundhog Day, it's like it's gorgeous. And um, so it was like the land of milk and honey, right? And there's weed, and the weed is 10 times better, mm-hmm. or was 10 times better than the weed from Virginia. There was no seeds. Right. I was shocked the first time. Somebody's like, yeah, it's, I don't know what the cost is now, but. In 1995, they were like, I'm like, I was like, let me get an eighth. And they're like, 60 bucks. I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? And, and then those dudes had to be like, bro, watch. And then I, and it was just just spongy, no seeds, just, oh, sticky, icky. I was like, oh, my Lord, I make that a quarter. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got a buck 20. You know, like, it was just like, whoa, my God. And so I was j- diving in. I get it. That's when I kind of got introduced to meth. Now, the crazy thing is, now, I was in treatment when I was 16 years old. Oh, shit. So 1987, I was in treatment. Mm. Right? So I had already had some experience with, and I, you know, knew that that I, you know, had right. issues that mm. I knew that I liked. I always do these air quotes because I don't really, I, ultimately, I didn't like crystal meth, but I couldn't stop doing it. Mm. Sure. <laughs> when it came yeah. down to it. Yeah. <clears throat> Made That's you tweakerish. What didn't you like about it? I just did, I mean, that my teeth were falling out, that I would, yeah. what I would do is I would, uh, I would like not eat, not drink, totally cave in. Right, right. Uh, sexual deviancy. Um, I would push everybody away and then blame them for abandoning me. Right. Right. And that kind of stuff. And it was awful. And I was such a tweaker at the end, literally two weeks after 9 11, a month after 9 11, right before the shoe bomber guy was, was uh, found. Yeah. I smoked crystal meth in the bathroom on an international flight. Wow. Up, torch, pipe, in, I had the pipe in my boot and I faked like a limp. And I had a pipe. I mean, if anybody doesn't know what a pookie is, they call it a pookie. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I had, I had it in my boot. If I, if I had snapped that thing while I was walking, I'm surprised you didn't. Jesus, because the pookie, they got that fat ball at the end. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, imagine, and then I'm, and I got glass shards and meth shards on my feet, my foot. So I didn't, and I made it on the plane, and I went in the bathroom, and I'm smoking meth. Look, literally looking at the smoke detector, going, "What am I doing? Yeah. What am I doing? Now, see, that's where I say." I'm, I wasn't doing that because I liked it. That's what I mean when I say I didn't right. like it. Right. I didn't like that shit. I would not have chosen to do that. I was a slave. Mm-hmm. That's beyond my thinking. It wasn't me going, I'm, I can get away with this. It was me going, oh my God, what the fuck am I doing? What am I? And I'm looking at the smoke detector. And then I had some stroke of genius and I hit the, the flush and the plunger for the uh, thing and slowly blew it into the thing. So it sucked uh, it yeah. and the air sucked down. I flushed the toilet like five times. It's like they had to do in prison. Is that how you had to roll? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Blow it in the toilet and flush the toilet. That's exactly, yeah, yeah. okay, so I would have been done fine. I wasn't in prison. I just watched a lot of 60 Days. Yeah, he, yeah, he just, swears he wasn't. I just, yeah, just yeah. FYI. Yeah, I didn't even know that was a thing until that yeah. very moment. Mm-hmm. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah, man. <laughs> so that's what I mean when I didn't when I say I didn't like it. Now, again, going back into my life, when I was a kid, 
I'm jumping all over the place. I tend to do that. That's totally cool. When I was, was going to ask you about child. Yeah. Because we started talking about snot right away, so we kind of dropped into 1995. But when I was a kid, man, I you know I share this regularly because it's true for me. There, I had these these like tendencies to be a little depressive yet super like extroverted at times mm -hmm. and you know I might call it manic depression but I'm not clinically manic depressive but um, I would have these thoughts of like if the three of us were friends the two of you were closer friends with each other than either of you were with me mm -hmm. so I was like I'm out here and like she doesn't want to talk to me I suck on guitar I can't dance right yeah. and then I like had a drink or you know smoke some weed and I'd be like oh man I'm so creative dude mm -hmm. I'm so Oh, bro, we're tight. Hey, we're all three, man. We're fuck, three amigos, right? Right. And then I, I can, oh, I can dance, right? And she does want to talk to me. What's up, girl? You know, like it would do oh, this yeah. thing for me. It changed me here in my in here. Yeah. What I didn't realize was happening happening concurrently, if you will, is that because of whatever DNA, I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but in this body and mind is the condition that we refer to as alcoholism, which in my experience. In, again, in this body, encompasses addiction as part of it. I just call it alcoholism because that's what we say in, in AA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I just refer to it as alcoholism, but I'm referring to pretty much any mind-altering substance that I did mm -hmm. um, what it, what, that had an effect on me. Yeah. I was, I'm pretty much not in charge of what happens next. Sure. Yeah. Right. So when I discovered a drink and a drug and it changed my thinking about me and everything around me, I started to rely on that mentally and then physically my body was craving it right mm -hmm. and so it talks about in the big book that we have a physical allergy so mm -hmm. not not an allergy like I have a nickel allergy like I can't wear um like metal mm -hmm. uh my skin breaks out and shit right and once I realized it I was like I'm not wearing that shit anymore yeah. mm -hmm. I can wear surgical steel but I can't wear like nickel right mm -hmm. And um, I mean, my, down to my belt buckle and everything. I can't it'll fuck up my skin down here. <laughs> and so, um, let me get some gal come back to the place or something. What is going on above your? Uh, it's just an allergy. Don't <laughs> you worry about that. <laughs> Don't you worry about. It. I'll just cover it up. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> right. it's, no, it's, no, as you were. Yeah. As, as you, you were. were. Yeah, just right here, right here. Just look right here. <laughs> look me in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> I like it right here, honey. Sorry, this is inappropriate. <laughs> totally inappropriate. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So <laughs> that that allergy that I discovered was not coupled with an, a, a, an obsession of my mind, right? right? Once I realized what it was, I was like, no more nickel touches my skin, rad. But with this particular allergy, it, it's coupled with a mental obsession, right? Some kind of peculiar mental twist that tells me that I can, should, deserve to, they are doing it so I should be able, why can't I just have a drink, mm -hmm. right? That kind of, what, who wants a drink? <coughs> A non-alcoholic, somebody who's not yeah, an alcoholic is like, I'll have a drink. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, a, a drink? Like what? All right? Like I just want to like smoke a hit of crystal meth? Like no, <laughs> nobody that, except for people that are addicts and alcoholics think that way. And yeah. I had I realized that later. But as a kid, I didn't realize this was happening. And man, it got me, dude. I got, I got, I was addicted to weed. Um, a buddy of mine had Dexedrine. You guys know what Dexedrine is? I don't. It's today's. It's like it went like it's a pres it's a prescription for AD ADD and ADHD oh, okay. or was. So it was Ritalin, Dexedrine, Adderall, gotcha. and and other ones that they tried that are like that. Uh, yeah, but but Dexedrine was like the '80s, late '80s. Uh, it's basically meth, mm -hmm. and so I started doing that with a buddy of mine, and I got strung out on that shit, and I ended up in rehab when I was 16 years old. Because it gives you like that hyper focus, I'm guessing, or something. Yeah, it's yeah. Supposed to calm got down me, the. Got me high. It's not me. I didn't. I don't have ADD. Yeah. So with him, it was like he was like, like it calmed him down. Yeah. But with me, it was I was like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I'm gonna play riffs for 72 hours straight. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into rehab? Like, family saw you and were like, yeah. you need help, and you were just like, all right. You were, well, you were no, cool. no, did no, you go down with a fight? Yeah, I tried, but I was 16, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. So that particular time, um, I had been getting in trouble for a long time. Uh -huh. I was a latchkey kid. My parents both worked. They weren't really around, so I was. I mean, I was just. It was. I was up for grabs. I could do whatever the hell I wanted right. to. And until it was too much trouble, and I was wasn't going to school, and then they'd be like, "Wait a minute, why does your report card have white out all over it?" <laughs> right? Because I was just fake. I was just cut, you know, changing everything. And so, um, my parents were divorced, but only, we only lived. They only lived a block away from each other. Like I guess it was trying to be convenient for the kids or whatever, uh -huh. even though both of them were working and weren't really around. But um, they were doing what they had to do as you know parents. Yeah. And so uh, I was getting in a lot of trouble. And so finally. Um, 
one night I was like hanging out with the boys and I snorted a bunch of Dexedrine. We were drinking MD 2020. You know what I'm talking about? Mad, Mad Dog, Dog 2020, yeah. 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 Here's the thing. I did uh, not drink because I liked the taste of alcohol. I yeah. drank for the effect produced. Sure. Yeah. Sure, a rum and Coke or a, a Crown and Coke tastes, yeah, this tastes cool. A beer, I used to like Killian's Red because it was kind of sweet. Mm. Sure. That's not why I'm drinking it. I, maybe that's why other people, that's not why I drank. I drank for the effect produced. Yeah. I, wanted, I wanted oblivion. Right. Mm -hmm. So this particular night uh, I drank, I was drinking, I was doing some dexedrine, a buddy showed up with some acid. I think it was Red Star acid. Yeah, a little. And then I realized, oh shit, it's like nine o'clock on Tuesday. Like I got I got a curfew, I gotta go home, right? And so I go home, peeking on acid, I come in. My mom's never done had a drink or done a drug in her life. And I walk in and I'm like, pretty <laughs> out, And I'm all, mom, I have so much to tell you. <laughs> I, just, I sat her down and I was like, check it out. And I told her all, I don't know what else, I told her besides telling her that I had a message and that the only way she could really understand the message is if she were to liken me to the Messiah. Oh, Jesus. I didn't say I was Jesus, <laughs> but I said, you gotta kind of think, think of me of that me way. Yeah, right. Like, like I'm not What was her reaction to this? <laughs> right. I was in rehab the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I so guess wait. so, man. Thanks so, for the yeah. setup. That was, I lobbed it up and you went. I'm trying so, to like, I'm, I wanna be a fly on the wall for that conversation, dude. <laughs> right? I swear. I just picture you like 16 year old, just fucking wired out of your mind, out of your gourd, trying to explain to your mom to, to, to view me like you would if this was the second coming of Jesus. Yeah, but I got you, the, but the you, message. It was the message, yeah. yeah. But you said your mom, no drink, no drug. What about dad, family history? No. Her, I think both of their parents were alcoholics. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at some point they found Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so then they, you know, didn't drink, well, allegedly. Right. My mom says that she thinks, because my dad, her dad would always be going to church on like a Wednesday or Thursday. Mm -hmm. So sometimes she's like, I think maybe he was going to AA meetings. At the church, oh, potentially. Yeah. I mean, because, you know. Sure. That's where we have a lot of them. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, which is ironic, too. Uh, all the atheists and agnostics that we are. Yeah. And also religious people, but we have them in churches. And I'm like, yeah, cool. Yeah. It's because they, it's, cause it's cheap rent. Yeah, yeah <laughs> this is it, true. That's why. We're not religious. This is cheap rent. Yeah, the vast majority of the ones that I attend, now that you mention it, other than uh, a Zoom group that I got, uh -huh. is all the, the churches. churches and, church yeah. basements and shit, yeah. And so when I went to rehab at 16... I uh, I did this thing where they admitted me or whatever, and then when I went in, I didn't. I, again, this is me being uh, completely honest and, and aware back then that what, of what I did not know. Mm -hmm. Back then, I did not believe I was an alcoholic because I thought that it had to have alcohol connected to it. Sure. So I was telling people, I'm just an addict. Alcohol is not my problem. I don't have a problem with alcohol. What I didn't realize is that in this kind of like. Uh, cunning, baffling, and powerful disease, if you will, in mind, I was actually reserving the right to drink. Right. Yeah. I was planning on drinking. Yeah. Like, if I can't do drugs, I'm going to drink. And I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of it. Right. Or if I was, I was like lying to myself and be like, oh, that's not right. So eventually, I, I actually started sneaking around around six months, sneaking around to my friend's parents' liquor cabinets mm. and getting them in trouble for without them alone. Mm. Right. I'm drinking my buddy Paul Willis. I made a mention to him a long time ago with Paul. Sorry, bro. <laughs> That he, he, got, he called me and be like, man, my dad's pissed at me. He said I you know, drank his booze from his liquor cabinet. And I was like, oh, that sucks. And it was, I had the bottle right there in my hand. You know, right, on the right. Phone. It was, that's, you know, that's an alcoholic, Sonny. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Now, I didn't really like alcohol when it came down to the end. I rarely drank. Um, it's not because I'm not an alcoholic. It's because I, there was, I had a substitute. Right. And so I, you know, I also like to dispel, for me, I, this is my... I've been sober 19 years, 11 months, and nine days as of today. Mm -hmm. And so th I've had a lot of time to talk about this and think about this shit. The term drug of choice would imply that I chose, that I made a conscious decision about what drug I right. want to be the one. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I would not and did not choose crystal meth. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not very distinguished, not very elegant. And no, I don't it's, think it's, it's, it's dirty. It's gross. Yeah. I was talking to, we talked to Tim and Jen uh, Ryan a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about how cocaine was the champagne of drugs. Yes. It's okay to do cocaine, because yes. celebrities do it, actors do yeah, it, musicians coke. do it, yeah. it's fine. But meth, because I had done meth too, and it was just so dirty. Yeah, you know, I had that with coke though. I had the Me jaw too, yeah, thing. Everybody yeah. knew. Oh, look, look, Mikey's on coke. Look, and I'd be sitting there like doing my jaw and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I want to know what when you're in rehab or in treatment at 16. 
were you like, dude, uh, it's not like I'm never going to fucking drink again. Like, this is ridiculous. Or did you have the same mentality with drugs as well? Ask. What I can tell you, like, that consciously that happened was I was so miserable. For the first two weeks, I shut down, dissociated. I was like, man, pouting mm-hmm. and just being a 16-year-old Same. punk kid, right? Yeah. And then this person who at a meeting who really was trying to be helpful and uh, didn't kind of tell me what this phrase meant that he was going to give me to try to help me get sober and stay sober. He, this guy, I was like, there's a meeting happening here, and I'm like, turn, the, turn this way or whatever. And uh, this guy comes over, and he's like, hey, man. And I was like, what, dude? He's like, fake it till you make it. And I was like, thanks. It <laughs> rhymes, fake it till you make it. What he didn't do was he didn't tell me what that meant, right. what, it, what it means. Now, it's still used today, this phrase, fake it till you make it. First of all, he didn't tell me what it was that I was supposed to fake, nor did he tell me what it was that I would then make. I did not know what he was talking about. Fake it till you make it. For anyone who doesn't know or anyone who's throwing it around, please tell the newcomer what you actually mean by this besides this clever rhyme because I drank on it because I faked it. He sure. said, fake it till you make it. And I was like, thanks, bro. And then I went, hmm, okay. So I started lying. I was like, little son, he was doing great. I was at all the groups and saying all the things and literally just giving them lip service of what they wanted to hear. And they were like, I'm so proud of you. And I was like, great. Awesome. I think Thanks. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. Life is complete. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. Well, and I ask you that I question too because when I was in re- I was in rehab at 21 and I was just like it's not like I'm never not going to drink ever again. You guys are tripping if you think that. So that's why I was wondering is that a common thing for a young person going into I, I would imagine. think cuz like we talked when we talked with uh, Sheen, you know, like he said that he was what 20, 21 or I something don't like it like was a young age though. Plus, it's, it, I would think probably, you know, at your point, being 16 years old, going to that, too, is, okay, I'm going to get mom and dad to fuck off my back. It wasn't like, wow, you know what, I'm, I'm lying to my friend, I'm stealing his booze, getting him in trouble, and, you know, like, none of those. Yeah, there was no those, conscious. Yeah. That was mine. Moral type of thing going yeah. on. Getting what he just said, getting mom off my back, that was mine. That's exactly That's what why I was doing, I by went, faking yeah. it till mm-hmm. I was making it. Yeah. Now, what that means is, fake it till you make it means... Just do the actions. Take the actions, faking it, meaning just do it. But even if you don't believe in it, just do it. Right. And then watch it happen. Then all of a right. sudden you'll be like, oh, shit, I feel better. I'm actually, uh, I don't have the desire to drink and use. Like, things will change. It's almost like, or it's exactly like, if I were to hire a physical trainer, mm-hmm. I don't have to believe anything. Mm-hmm. All I have to do is what, do, was what that person says. They say, do this many push-ups, this many pull-ups, do, do, do these lap pulls, do these whatever things, eat this, do that, and it doesn't matter what I believe. I'll, I'll feel better, I'll get physically fit, right? It yeah. doesn't matter what I think. So that's what fake it till you make it actually means. But I feel, I mean, for me, again, it's like there's these clever little cliches that I think are dangerous in the fellowship. Mm. That we just, that's like a little one size fits all. Right. Just, oh, just, here's the answer, you just gotta do this. Mm-hmm. Oh, is that it? That's all I gotta do. Yeah. You just gotta know that there's a God and you're not it. No, man, I need way more than that. Yeah. I'm smarter than that. But I'm a, I, I can relate to that because I'm one of those people that really had to dig into, and it's <clears> funny <throat> you brought up the, the atheist or agnostic, and we see it so many times, you know, it's, you know, it's like if someone just goes, well, brother, Jesus saves. And it's like, well, okay, what if that's not it? So was it a struggle for you with the higher power concept? I'm glad you asked. Yeah. Yes. Um, my grandfather on my dad's side in Virginia, Pentecostal pastor. Oh. Uh, no snakes. They were down the street. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. I was I was like, were you there? I was about ready to go. Where are the bikes? Where Which one bikes? is Pentecostal? Um, With snakes, what do you mean? Like, if you believe you're not going to get bit, kind of thing. Well, there's this like this. I guess they'd be the serpent sect. I don't know what they would call it, but that's like you ever seen the ones that are holding the snakes and yeah. Isn't know? the whole process like if you believe you're not going to get bitten, so hold the snake? It's not uh, something like yeah. If you believe yeah, if you have faith, you're safe. Yeah, yeah. And this Church, proves this don't... shows your faith. Right. But it's right, very. Right. Uh, but if you get bit, uh, you non-believer. But it's yeah, it's very. You fucked up. You could have just you gotten an up. aggravated <laughs> snake. <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. yeah, but they don't see it though. Luckily, but it, but no it's sense. a very like jovial like the dancing up the aisles. Charismatic and, is yes. what they call it, right? And yes. there's also speaking in tongues. Oh yeah. And yeah, so, yeah, because, yeah. So for anybody who's been watching, you ever see Borat? Remember the movie? Oh yeah. Yeah. That was a Pentecostal church. Gotcha. No, I've heard tongues. That was my rehab. 
Okay. Yeah, it was very. Um, is apostolic also in tongues? I don't know. Probably okay. if it's charismatic, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I was in, and I'm not apostolic. I'm Catholic. So when they were saying you have to speak in tongues to get into heaven, I'm just kind of <laughs> like, okay, you know what? I said. Aside from me being here thinking that I don't need to be here because I was the same way. I'm in the corner like, Meh, and I'm just thinking, well, if I get into a fight, I'll get kicked out. And that'll look way better than me just quitting like a little bitch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into a fight. I'm going to get kicked out. And then they did the talking in tongues, and I'm just like, okay. I'm like, Mom, you're Catholic. you got to see where I'm coming from now. you got to get me out of here. But everybody was just too damn nice, so I couldn't get into a fight. Mm. But I get what you're saying. They were, man. They it's were in fi- like in Fight Club. You have to go pick a fight and yeah. lose. Yeah. And you're like, the stable? <laughs> yeah, tries to fight the priest. <laughs> and he's like, hey. But, okay, so that that was going on with yours. So what was yeah. in your head? Yeah, like? well, um, so I didn't, I, it terrified me. Sure. Yeah. Um, my dad was an atheist. Ew. So son of a preacher man, atheist, because of his experience with his father before he found Jesus. Sure. My dad uh, was not into it. Um, he was he was he assessed the situation and was like, No I'm thanks. Mm-hmm. No thank you. Um, and my mom is uh, my dad's been gone for uh, in two thousand thirteen. Mm-hmm. My mom's still alive. Mom's very much into Jesus. Mm-hmm. And um, so there I was, my sister too, the two of us sitting between an atheist and a deeply devout person mm-hmm. and we're going and i was like no no mm-hmm. i'm not i don't feel like nothing but i don't feel that and then there's this man i love up there granddaddy and he's fucking and i was like oh my god what the hell <laughs> yeah. and then check this out this was so funny i mean this is so funny this is a part big part of my story is when I was eight or nine, I was getting into rock, maybe uh-huh. 10, uh, Zeppelin and ACDC and Kiss. And, yeah, buddy. Right, all the things. Um, 1980, 81 at this yeah. time, right? And so my sister brought a tape and, and, and was like, hey, granddaddy did a seminar with this guy. She put the tape in and it's a seminar on backwards messages in rock music. Oh, Jesus. On tape, right? And so this guy, you know, straight out of South Kakalaki or wherever, where he was like, can you say you believe in yeah. Jesus Christ? And so he's talking about the Beatles and all the things. And he's like, listen to this song right here. And he played Black Dog by Led Zeppelin. Mm. And he's like, hear the beat and the, the serpent and the sex and all this stuff. And then he played it backwards. Oh, it was like, hey, hey, mama said the way you move, gonna mm-hmm. make you sweat, gonna make you groove. And he played it backwards and it was like, Satan is my prince. Yeah, I must worship him. And I fucking heard it. And then he was like, here's God of Thunder by Kiss. I'll we rob you of your virgin up. soul. <laughs> what a great song. My favorite Kiss song. Yeah, I, I want it. Yeah, let's go, God of Thunder. And then, uh, Highway to Hell. Hey, Satan, pay my dues. I was going to say, you don't need to rewind it for Highway to Hell. It tells you. In the, it's right, yeah. straightforward. Um, and dude, you guys, that shit gave me night terrors because I loved everything he was playing, and I would wake up in the middle of the night and and I would literally see demons gnashing. I was screaming and shit. And I remember my dad and my mom came in like, whoa, and my dad was like, see, see what that shit does. Like, like not the music, the fucking religious stuff. Right. My dad was like, see the fear that this puts in, because he, I mean, and again, my dad was not. A, you know, he was yeah. not a pinnacle of spirituality, <laughs> but he was like, "See," and my mom's like, "No, it's the music, right?" And so, there, and then my dad did later when I got older. He was not into me putting kiss posters on my. It was always like my posters on my walls were the problem, mm-hmm. right? And so yeah. I had to tear them down and all this other stuff. But that shit fucked me up. And then one day I realized, one night, whatever, if they were gonna kill me, if these demons were gonna tear me apart, wouldn't they have done it already? And I never saw them again. Hmm. They were like, "He's not afraid." I wasn't afraid. It's kind of one of the earliest lessons, probably a power of mind. Potentially. And then I was on a high. <laughs> yeah, it's like a lot of Zeppelin tracks. I've heard a lot of like weird messages, and it's the majority of it was Zeppelin. There's one on Stairway to Heaven, too. How I don't did, remember how what did part Robert of it Plant sing something backwards? Yeah. I mean, it's Robert Plant. I like that, like, Motley Crue purposely injected shit in there just oh, to yeah. piss people off. You're Yo, like, oh, when my I... soul's on fire. It's and it was like, backwards. Yeah, 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 it's like, oh, they're just wanting to piss people off. Well yeah. done. Well played. You want to hear a little side story? When yeah, I, was, yeah. I went to MI, this music institution institute down here, uh-huh. uh, after after I was in Seven Dust. 
Uh, and we did a snot reunion. Then I went to school for audio engineering, started producing some bands and shit, whatever. But while we were in there, we did this like this mixing class or whatever. And so the last day of the of the class, the uh, instructor was like, "Hey, here's the multi tracks for Rock of Ages. Oh, wow. I'll put it up on the thing, and you guys can mix it." He had the, the separate tracks on there, and I was and I was 38 at the time. I'm all, hold on, boys. This is from my era. Y'all just sit back. And so I went up there and started mixing it. And I found, and I was looking at the Pro Tools waveforms, and there was this one track that had two little blips in it. And I went and I soloed them and listened, and it was like, and I'm like, what? And I and I scrubbed it backwards, and one of, and it was one of them was fuck the Russians, because it was eighty whatever yeah, yeah. Cold War, and it was, and then I met Joe Elliott, so a British fucking, rock band, yeah. yeah. So then like so then like oh, that was two thousand nine or ten. So then like two and a half three years later, I was on tour with Ugly Kid Joe, and we were playing in Dublin, I think, with uh, Duff's band, um, Loaded. Shout out to, to uh, Mike Squires and the boys and Loaded, um, and. Uh, <laughs> Joe Elliott was there, and I had my moment. I was like, "Hey, Joe." I saw, I was at the, and I told him I was at the school. I said, "I found this thing," and he goes, "You found the golden ticket, mate." <laughs> he goes, "Yeah." He goes, "Yeah." Me and Mutt Lang were just fucking around in the studio, and so I, we were like, "Let's throw some," because you would never hear it on yeah. that. Even the um, the like yeah. that's I don't know what that's one, two, three, four. I don't know what it is. Yeah, backwards. it's like from. Um, like the day the earth stood still or uh, something like that one of those classes i should have yeah. scrubbed that backwards i didn't yeah. do that it's also on the offspring they use that too oh yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah, yeah. so he's like come out yeah. and play huh yeah. yeah yeah he's like me and mutt were just messing around so we threw some stuff in there he's like you found the gold ticket i was like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so back to recovery so did yeah he give man. you his chocolate factory after yes he did. He's like, here <laughs> we go it's yeah. all yours but yeah uh yeah man so eventually i you know i was like that's oh oh so the the question of of faith, right? Yeah, because it's uh, a hard thing for a lot of people to oh, come man. to. When I walked into, the, when I went to my like, first AA meetings and rehab, I was like, fuck this, man. man. Fuck all of this. Mm -hmm. God and all this. I was like, okay. I'm not, you know, I was like, I'm not into it. So basically what I did was that God that I was so terrified of, I hated it. Yeah. And so I lashed out against it. Mm -hmm. But what I did ultimately in that process was I took myself personally sort of out of contention for a spiritual connection of my own mm -hmm. right. um I, you know and i say this anybody who hears me talk at meetings or whatever hears me talk i say this often like i love animals i love connection i love intimacy i love kids i love art i love period right i love period mm -hmm. um i'm a lover and i like being kind i actually enjoy it not just nice not just being nice but being kind i really enjoy it it's part of my nature but I was so angry and so lost and so sad that I acted out on that stuff and I went really dark and heavy. And mm -hmm. But I was still like me. There was still like this mm -hmm. sweet guy in there too. But I was poisoning myself and it fueled drinking and using and, and it kept me out of contention for like a real spiritual connection. And then um, when I, so that was in rehab, I was like, I, I mean, I didn't do a single step when I was a kid in, mm -hmm. in rehab. Oh, I had a sponsor. I asked a guy to be my sponsor because his name was Lars. <laughs> what was know? his last name? I can't remember. Ah, but hey, it that first name it Lars wasn't, works. It wasn't right? Ulrich. I was gonna yeah. say we might he was know like that. you know, Sonny, come on, let's hang out, bro. We're gonna listen to some Motorhead. Yeah, this is non-addictive cocaine. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you met my father? So um, <laughs> his dad was rad. Gandalf is his dad. Yeah. Uh, oh, dude. Yeah. People that don't know, watch uh, some, kind, some of kind of monster. The monster. documentary you'll see. With if Lars you were telling dad. me that there was a song about a man in an echo chamber, I would say like his dad just bashed. Every Everything it was so good, and he was right. His dad was right. It was all shit. <laughs> that album was. So, so uh, that's the guy. The reason I asked the guy to be my, and he wrote a Harley. Oh, how about this thing people say in AA meetings? And I'm again, I'm a twelve stepper, so I'm and I'm kind of bashing the fellowship in a way because I think that we get far away from the actual program. And I what, agree. And what gets us to what gets me to recover? I like agree. I've recovered from alcoholism today. Mm -hmm. I'm not recovering. I'm not recovering. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I'm not. I don't say I'm a recovering alcoholic. It says in the book that we recovered from alcoholism right. to show others precisely how we recovered. In italics mm -hmm. is the purpose of this book. So if I take the twelve steps in order as they're laid out, I'm going to recover from alcoholism, mm -hmm. and then I will be recovered. Doctor Bob was brilliant. What was it the Dalai? That Lama? was that was Silkworth. Doctor Dalai Lama. What said it best? Oh. One of the best inventions of the uh, the twentieth century. That was Aldous was, Huxley. Aldous Huxley said that. The AA book. Yeah, that Aldous Huxley said. Oh, okay. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Atlas, we Atlas shrugged and all that shit. Yeah, yeah, okay. Atlas Huxley, yeah, yeah. I mm. think that was him. Uh, the book, but yeah, that was him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He said that shit. He said it was the 
Yeah, one of the biggest contributions to the 20th century. That's what it Social was. contribution, something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so Lars, yeah. And, uh, uh, but yeah, they say this in, in meetings, that, you know, if to, looking for a sponsor, find somebody who has what you want. <laughs> and I was like, well, that guy's got a Maserati. Right? What do you mean what I want? I don't know what the fuck I want. I want somebody who's not smoking meth today. Yeah. Right. That's all I wanted, really what I wanted. And that's what I got when I finally hit bottom at 30 years old and came in. But Lars had a fucking late name of Lars, rode a Harley, and had smoking hot girlfriends. So I was like, will you be my sponsor? I might have called him twice mm -hmm. in six months. And the, the second call was, um, I'm, fuck it, I'm out of here. He's like, sounds like you're going to drink. No. -uh. <laughs> and what did I do? I went and drank. Yeah. And then I tried controlled drinking, and that didn't, and I couldn't control and enjoy because well, you hear this like when I'm controlling I'm certainly not enjoying it yeah. mm -hmm. and when I'm enjoying it I'm out of control mm -hmm. right that's the the plight of the alcoholic um, and so I you know I went through my um, through my early 20s kind of I mean I was a pothead and that's when I got the snot gig and I flew out to, to Santa or I drove out to Santa Barbara and then it just progressed from there man mm -hmm. I, you know and I and really ultimately part of the my exodus from snot some people don't know this but or don't track it but I left snot before Lynn Strait died, I left the band. Right. And I was fucked up on meth when I did it. I was on meth and uh, I made a lot of mistakes, man. Um, Cause I was sick, yeah. you know? And I look back and I go, oh man, like we will not regret the past and I was just shut the door on it. I still have some regrets. I'm like, I wish I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I wish it didn't work out that way. Ultimately, thankfully, I did, I joined a band with, with uh, Shannon Larkin called Amen. Um, and uh, ultimately before Lynn died, he and I made up. Cause he and I were oh, not wow. friends when I left the band. We were not friends yeah. and um, ultimately they were like like Jamie Miller the drummer and then the guy who had replaced me left the band hmm. and there were three shows that were booked and um, they asked me to play Lynn was like hey man will you play these shows with us I said yeah dude I'll do it and we totally it was great man we you know buried the hatchet or whatever made peace yeah. and killed it these last three shows we were on fire man it's we that band was I mean especially Lynn was we were, it was so explosive that it's like I it couldn't continue man. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know so we did those shows and then the last conversation I had with Lynn Strait um, we were supposed to meet up and go to this party at the Key Club which was like for like some porn release <laughs> sick yeah, Matt, yeah <laughs> Matt Zane's band Society One was playing you know and, and uh, I was coming off meth that night and I couldn't get the fuck out of bed man so I texted him or whatever I called him or it was, it was beepers yeah. so I let, you know, sent him a message or whatever I don't know how I did it but I couldn't go, I, I couldn't make it. And then I called him the next day and was like, hey man, sorry, I couldn't, you know, I'm sick. I didn't yeah. even tell him oh. I'm coming down from meth. He I know that excuse. Yeah, he would have been like, oh, I'll get it. If I said, dude, I'm coming off meth, he would have been like, all right, cool, you got any more? <laughs> yeah, right. We smoked, he and I smoked meth out of a fucking light bulb one time in, <laughs> in Malibu in, in like this beautiful <laughs> spread in Malibu. What did you crack the end of? He, was, he did it, I don't know how he did it. When he did, I was like, "How are you doing that, bro?" Yeah, I want to hit that. Yeah, yeah. like I, I don't know because we get creative. I what, can see that. A what light bulb. You could do it. What you was get it from scene? the back? You poke hole in the back and then you drop it. And it's just like a pookie. But how did he break the glass of the? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He broke oh, yeah. the glass to make the pookie. Yeah, but, <laughs> I don't. But whatever. What, what was it? Uh, um, Freaking what movie with it? Uh, what's his name? Baldwin was it? And where he's like. Uh, Oh man, we don't have our bunk. Give me a funnel, a corkscrew, and an avocado. It's like we find our ways. We find the ways. <laughs> we find our fucking ways. Lynn to had it, bro. I was like, how that works too. I was amazed. I'm like, damn, bro. Yeah. Yes. Let me hit that. So uh, the last conversation I had with him, man, was really beautiful. I'm so happy. We just we had been on tour for, with each other for years, and you know, on 30 hour drives, maybe talk for you know 25 minutes straight, one on one, mm -hmm. and then like. We talked for like three hours on the phone, man. And at one point I was like, dude, we've been on the phone for like three hours. And he goes, rad, anyway, so check. And he, we kept talking. And it was so cool, man. Then a couple days later, Mikey Doling calls me. And and um, ironically, I don't know if it's ironic or not, but I'm, I had a, I was living with my friends and I had my own phone line. And I was watching TV and like a Geico commercial came on. And I was like, I don't have insurance and I'm driving all over the place. Oh, I called Geico for a, <laughs> for a, a quote. My friend comes in with the phone. He, Mikey called her line, and she's he's, she's like, "Hey, Mikey's on." I go, I tell him I got to call him back, and she goes, "Oh, okay." And she turns around and she goes, "Oh," and she's like, "Hey, Sonny, he said he really needs to talk to you." And so I'm on the phone. Hold on, Geico. Hey, Mikey, and he goes, "Are you sitting down?" And I said, "Hold on, I gotta go." Click, and I said, "What's up, dude?" And he goes, "He's gone, bro." I knew exactly what he meant. Mm -hmm. He just goes, "He's gone, bro," and I was like, "Damn!" I literally went, "Damn!" 
like that's today like we all knew it was gonna happen man mm -hmm. he was it's just how Lynn was you know Lynn would love you to death or hate you to death but either way he was going to kill you mm -hmm. yeah. yeah he was a lovely man and he was a maniac yeah yeah, yeah. and so I don't know if you guys know the, the thing he was in a car accident yeah. he pulled out on the freeway and I did not know that he was loaded and it was just a yeah. fuck, it was an accident he was loaded and judged it wrong and got t-boned and killed and yeah. Dobbs the dog that's on our cover Right, right. Um, with a lemon on his nose. It's not a tennis ball. It's a lemon yeah. with a snot logo on it. Dobbs was in the car, and they were going. In fact, I spoke at a meeting in Ventura, in-person meeting, uh, a couple weekends ago, a couple Saturdays ago, and I was sharing about that. I'm like, you know, this is my friend died up here, yeah. and there was a guy in the back that went, and like he was like all the way in the back. He's like he went like that, and I was like, I gotta talk to that dude after. He was the first person on the scene after that happened. Oh but shit! Oh wow! He's like, dude, it, me it was gnarly. Yeah, and he told me about it. I was like. Now I, you know, I again like I've been to the gates of death and all this other stuff, not just with drugs, but with heart attacks and shit. Right. So I'm not, I don't really shudder at talking about death. Like we're all, everybody poops, everybody dies, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And so I wasn't like, oh, I don't want to hear it. I was like, yeah, just tell me whatever, whatever you want to share with me, yeah. I'll hear it. Because mm -hmm. I'm obviously supposed to hear something here, yeah. right? Whatever reason I shared it, and then he was there, and he, we talked about it, and I was just like. Damn, because you know Lynn was an addict, man. He was yeah. a, a hardcore addict. I never saw him take one single drink, but he sure did do drugs heavily. Mm -hmm. And the poor dude had he had uh, Tourette's. I think he had serious anxiety and insecurity. Yeah. All kind. He had insecure tattooed across his stomach. It said I insecure in in like the the old English like a yeah, cholo yeah, kind yeah. of font, uh, but it said insecure. <laughs> How old was he when he died? Uh, 30. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because that's when then they did In fact, Angel Songs. three days from right? now is the anniversary. It will be the 25th, excuse me, 23 years yeah. since Lynn passed. Uh, yeah. December 11, 98. Yeah, because after yeah. that was when they did the Angel Song, right? Angel yeah. Song, yeah. yeah. It was a dedication to Lynn's to mom. mom. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which Clint Lowry wrote, yeah, yeah. from Seven Dust. So we just give you a little history, a little snot history there. But man, I tell you, that shit fueled me, man. I went, I had moved to Santa Clarita and there was like, you know, <laughs> meth and 22 year old hot girls Real who'd like right. to do meth Yeah, with guys who are in bands. And so I went fucking buck wild, man. Ultimate combination for toxicity. <sighs> yeah, dude. So I was 28, that's where it really, really started. Like really the, the you know the whirlpool mm -hmm. the drain i was starting to circle the drain and then i was going for it man and then i moved to hollywood uh or koreatown um and <laughs> lived in my guitar player paul figs dining room <laughs> very very elegant very you know <laughs> would you have a little four under the dining room table or something i had a uh yeah there was a small dining room table and i had this like a bed roll and a room divider like a thing and i'd put it to the side and i was like i mean it was and i I was like, yeah, whatever, and I didn't. This give works. Yeah, yeah, I didn't care. And then he, and then his room, his roommate was like uh, subletting the room, and she moved back after being in England or whatever, and she moved back in the house, and she was like, nah, <laughs> <laughs> this dude's gotta go. <laughs> no, there's not gonna be any. And Paul was like, sorry, dude, he's the greatest guy ever. Paul Fig, big props to Paul Fig, sweetest guy, great friend. And he was like, sorry, dude, you got. And so I moved into a place where my drug dealer. You guys know the term lower companion? Yes. Right. In this case, your lower companion is somebody who's like a hanger on, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. In this case, it was a funny thing. I was actually listening to another podcast called Breaking Anonymity with my friend MC Search. You know if you guys heard of that? Yeah, I have. Yeah, but he had this guy, um, Eli, from Living Legends. I think he was in uh, Three Melancholy. Um, what's it? Three Melancholy uh, Prophets? Shit, I can't remember. It's a rap group. But he was talking about this, how he would hang out with his drug dealer. The drug dealer wanted him around because he had it because he looked up to him, right. and he was around because he wanted the drugs, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the same thing was happening with me with that guy. I was the lower companion. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was hanging out with him because he had the drugs. I get to see, dude. You did Pop Goes the Weasel. Come hang out with me. Yeah, it wasn't him. It was the guy they had on the thing. Oh, on, okay. On the, but he has his own story. Yeah. Yeah. Pop Pop Goes the Weasel. The Weasel. Mikey's too young for that shit. Yep. It was. I don't a, know what the fuck you guys are. It's a rap song making fun of Vanilla Ice. Yep. Oh. There's also one called The Gas Face. You ever hear Gas Face? Uh. Uh. All right. Uh, it was like hardcore white dudes. I mean, Memsey Search is, a, is Jewish. Yeah. Uh -huh. From like uh, Rockaway Beach, you know, New York. Um, but uh, he's, you know, he went ahead and just kind of discovered this guy called Na Nas. Mm. Have you ever yeah. heard of that guy? Little, he, was, he did okay. Yeah. He, uh, he found this, you know, they were looking. Uh, he got with uh, 
shit, what's her name? There was somebody from um, whatever the label was, Def Jam maybe, uh, looking. F- they were like, hey, we heard of this kid, Nasty Nas, and MC Search found him in Queensbridge, and he was like, yo, I found that kid. That's part of the, uh, like, you can watch these documentaries on, on YouTube, on um, uh, Netflix. <clears throat> but anyway, so this guy was talking about the same thing. He was a lo- that's what I was. I realized it later. I was like, oh, my God. I was a lower companion. I moved into this <laughs> this fucking building on Sunset in Orange, right by Sunset and Highland, kind of. Okay. Yeah, down that way, right? Uh-huh. Not far, across from Hollywood High. Uh, I basically was squatting, and there was a guy that my friend <laughs> was getting drugs for every day, cocaine every day, who had the keys to this empty building and gave us the keys to run after hours parties. And I took a room in the middle of the place, and whenever I closed my door, complete darkness. I'd look at my clock. I didn't know if it was 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. I was like, what time? I don't care. It doesn't, didn't doesn't matter. matter. Yeah. And so I was, that's where I was living for a while. And then somehow I got a girlfriend <laughs> and she let me move in with her. Oh, no, I think I moved in with, uh, oh, there was a couple other places I moved before then. <laughs> Shit. Uh, but I finally eventually got my girlfriend let me move in with her. Um, and it was, I mean, and me and my dog. It was really the dog that she wanted there. Uh, and that's the truth. <laughs> she she, she didn't want the dog armed. She didn't want me. She wanted the dog. dog. Yeah, so uh, I was living with her. She and, and I and my dog went to Mammoth for New Year's. I had the last six months I had been going back and forth between coming off meth and going back back and forth, and she was, like, just getting so sick of it. And, just, you know. And, and she we, was a sober person. And we, well, she isn't an alcoholic, so she yeah. is not sober, but she's not an alcoholic. As we call mm-hmm. it a normie. You can call Some it that. There's nothing it normal about th- normal drinker. Normal drinker. Right. Right. Yeah. right. There you go. Yeah. Those people. There's nothing normal about them. They just don't. <laughs> right. have the, they just don't have the, what we have. <laughs> yeah. They got their other shit. Yeah. It's like, how can you do that? Yeah. They're like, I just don't have that thing. Yeah. Um, so she, uh, uh, she and I went to uh, Mammoth for the for New Year's, and on December 30th we got up there and I went to the bathroom and pulled out my pipe, my pookie out of the little sunglass case or whatever. And my bindle, which was in a magazine page, had my contained my stash of crystal meth dropped into the toilet. And I was like, oh, and I grabbed it out and I poured it on the back of the thing. And I'm like, oh, God, it's watching it just dissolve. And I licked it all and ate it all, smoked the rest of what was in my pipe, December 30th. Didn't sleep all night. And I'm laying there in the bed. And I would freak out anytime my girl would like try to cuddle with me and put her hand on my chest. I swear she, my heart would be pounding like yeah. this. I think she would feel it right. so I'd somehow roll over or whatever act like I was asleep god that was miserable that's why I say I don't uh-huh. like it yeah. what was I doing I was feeding a, a demon within me right. had nothing to do with having fun or partying or I like that I didn't like it man it, mm-hmm. I was a I was a slave next day I'm coming off meth I think I told you guys I faked an injury yeah, so yeah. I like, can't snowboard but f-. and then she saw me coming off and she's like killer we get back down the hill on January 2nd I'd been dry for three days because I couldn't find meth in uh in mammoth i probably could have if i really looked but i couldn't i, I was coming down so hard i right. couldn't keep my eyes open and then the, the when we got back down the hill back to santa monica she's like get i don't want you here get out your dog can stay but you got to go oh, no. yep and then she and my dog left where'd and, they go uh, i don't know they went like that was somewhere. the last time you ever heard from no 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 oh. we got married later <laughs> Did you? Yeah. oh shit eight years later or something like that yeah yeah oh wow we're divorced now but we uh, yeah, oh we got, sorry yeah yeah <laughs> big props to colleen yeah, she put up with some shit, um, and before and after I got sober. <laughs> well, um, well, because the, the thing is, people too. I think one of the one of the things that maybe we it was good for newcomers to know is like, look, this is going to help you. It's a blueprint almost. It's a, it's an idea of where it can take you with your sobriety. But there's a bunch of other shit underneath that you are going to have to uncover and unwork. And I actually think one of our conversations that was. 15 years ago, 16 years, I mean, shit, you and I met that long ago. 17 years ago, maybe, I don't 2016, know. 2016, uh, six. Yeah, so, 15, whatever. 15, 15, 15 and a half, we'll 15, call it, summer yeah. of 06. You know, for me, it was the, the toxic relationship and women and that idea <clears throat> that some hot chick was going to complete me and all those things. And that's, you know, that was the shit I had to, to unwind along with being in the home of an addict as a child and everything yeah, else. And, it's you know, it's like, okay, you're going to get clean. But it doesn't end there. You still got the stuff to deal with, your defects and, and Hooray for therapy. It, yeah. Mm-hmm. And things to keep in check. Like it's 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 your job to still keep this shit in check. Like your shit doesn't necessarily go away. 
but you learn new tools to keep it in check to what you can shut it down really quick or quicker than you used to or at least address it as it comes up yeah, yeah. i don't know about yeah. shutting it down because i'm in therapy now I, it took me 19 years of sobriety before i like succumbed to therapy <laughs> i mm. now i work in treatment and sometimes i see how therapists work with people and i'm just like nah, i don't really want that yeah. kind of therapist yeah but i have done uh, different modalities in sobriety after i recovered from alcoholism so t i you know once I, I'll f finish the bottom real quick. Sure. That day, she and my dog left, and I was like, I don't know what to do, man. I was like, I was at this turning point, like a like a jumping off place, whatever you want to call it. And I was like, I don't know how to keep going and doing this, but I can't stop. Yeah. And so I have a wonderful friend who's one of my Inuits. I don't say Eskimo anymore. I say Inuit, <laughs> uh, Roxanne. Um, and uh, her her brother is Ross Robinson, who produced the first two Corn records, yeah. and the Biscuit and Sepultura, and all this. And Amen, he did two Amen records, uh, three Amen records. I was on three, I think. Anyway, um, I met him. I met her through him. We became dear friends when I was smoking meth, and she was still and she was already sober for ten years. Mm. But we were we became super tight and dear friends, and she would swoop in and take me to get good food when I was all sucked up. She'd take me to like some vegan restaurant. And the funny thing is, I'd be like, "Can we go to Carl's Jr.? I'm just oh, <laughs> fucking Jack in a Box. I don't want to go to Real Foods Daily and get a walnut meatloaf." Like, no, she's like, <laughs> "We'll go to Starbucks after. You can get a giant foamy latte with all the milk you want." And funny thing, now I'm vegan, yeah. <clears throat> just because. Um, and so. Uh, she had said to me at one point, she's like, she would never push it on me, man. She did it by the book, man. She would sit with me lovingly, calmly, and just, yeah, and she would calmly talk to me and just share experiences with me. And she wouldn't be like, dude, you're fucked up. You could, you know, whatever. Yeah. And she wouldn't try to scare me. This is gonna be, it's gonna get worse. You know, none of that, man. She would just talk to me and share her experience. And then one day she's like, all right, but Sonny, what if you ever, because I would say, I really would not, I'd like to not smoke crystal meth. But she's like, if you ever really are ready for the help, just call AA. And I was like, no, I don't have the, I, some stupid junky thing to say. I don't have the number. <laughs> and she's like, okay, buddy, I'm going to give it to you and you'll never forget it. And I was like, watch me forget it like that. Yeah. And she goes, you're not going to forget it. This is back in the day of actual like landlines. I mean, I guess they're still, but she goes, the number is 411. Huh. For those of you who don't know, 411 was directory assistance. You I call, forgot about that. 411. And, yeah. then you, and you get a human on the phone. And like, Star 69, remember that? You could do that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I go 411, you know, and the human answers. Yeah. yeah. So I was sitting on my girl's bed and I'm like, oh my God. That conversation with Roxanne came back and I went, and I don't know. I didn't, I didn't go, you know what? I'm going to get sober. I got an idea. I'm gonna, I did not think that. It was pure desperation. And so I picked up the phone. I went 411. Someone answered, Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I mean, sorry, uh, directory assistance. I said, can I have the number for Alcoholics Anonymous? Sure, for just this additional 30 cents, we'll connect you. And oh, then, shit. remember that? that part yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. You could get connected for 30 cents. And so I'm like, peep. My girl paid for that shit. <laughs> Thanks, Colleen. That's it's, uh, so funny. Right? Remember that? Yeah. I totally, I do now. Yeah, yeah I remember it now. Yeah. <laughs> we'll never forget it. I'd be, <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. And so, uh, somebody answered AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was like, I, I need help. I can't stop. And she goes, great. I was like, what? Now, mind you, I had been to meetings. I went to rehab, right? right? I, can, I, I might be one of those people that might pull out the phrase, this isn't my first rodeo. This was my first rodeo. Right. Today is my first rodeo. I've never been sober 19 years, 11 months, and nine days. Right. And even if I had, I haven't been today. Right. This is my first rodeo, man. I have to look at it that way. I'm not, I'm not afraid of relapse. I don't have a healthy fear of relapse. That's nonsense. I've recovered from alcoholism, but I still have to do the things right. today. And I like doing the things. And, and I think maybe that's another thing, too, that concept of one day at a time that people may not understand. I didn't it's, understand it. Yeah, it's that, that reset of every day. There's a 24-hour yeah. cycle. And, and it, well, know. it really, what I like, and how I like to look at it is it takes the pressure off me. Like, almost like you were saying, Mikey, about staying sober for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I don't have to look at it that way. Yeah. Sure. Ultimately, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. Right, sure. But it, 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 I don't have to, I don't have today, I don't have to stay sober forever. Right, right. And, it's, and so when I realized that, I was like, oh, and it really, like, took pressure off me and it made me go, oh, okay, because I can't do it myself like this is the thing about you know powerlessness and mm -hmm. and whatever being an alcoholic i don't have power over this when i'm sick and certainly not over my body when i'm sick mm -hmm. but as i recover and i get recovered things get easier now but life still happens right so i hit bottom that day and went to a meeting 
down the way, and this guy, this awesome human, there was five people in this meeting, and this, I was like, I don't know what to do, man, I can't stop. And they clapped, that's what we do in Southern California, clap for everybody. You guys mm. clap up now? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. clap. California. Um, and so this guy goes, hey man, you need to go to Mario's tomorrow. And I was like, okay, what's that? And he goes, it's a pizza place on Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica. It was, it was a block away from where we were. Go there tomorrow and tell them you need help. And so I did, I went there the next day and, and I was like, I was desperate to get in the middle of the room. Again, I wanna give props to whatever it was in me that that was so desperate and so willing that I didn't think, fuck this, it's a bunch of dudes, I don't wanna hang out with a bunch of, I'm not gay, or whatever stupid things people right. say. Um, I didn't think, this is, this is my first rodeo, like I was in A before, I didn't think any of that shit. I was like, I am drowning and I need help, please help me. Mm. And they were like, okay. And then you start, I, I started taking the steps, but I went on tour when I had 18 days, went to Australia, um, and did the Big Day Out tour when I had 18 days. And now here's what I like to point out too, is I had like a respite, if you will, like a grace period where like I was safe at that point in time. I, I, I don't, I can look back at it and see it. I wasn't conscious of it then. I was aware that I was extremely happy to not be doing drugs. I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. I was hanging out with all my friends, my buddies in System of a Down, they were on that tour. We were hanging out with Drowning Pool, my boy, props to Dave Williams, big love to Dave who also died of this yeah. fucking you know, disease. I don't know, he drank and then took pills and died in his bunk, had a heart attack or something, my buddy. That was a great dude, man, that was a sweet guy. Um, and so uh, they were all, and I hung out, and no effects, oh, I hung out with the drummer in no effects some, because he was sober. So I just kind of like mm, hung around him and uh, Eric. And, uh, and But I slept and I ate and I walked around and saw the sights in New Zealand and Australia and all this other, and I was really fucking happy, man. Mm -hmm. And I had zero dollars, I had $175 a week per diem to live on, to do everything <laughs> with, $25 a day. Here's $700 a month, good luck, uh, right? And I was on a major label. Um, and so <laughs> They're gonna take care of you. Yeah, and so when I got home, I was like, oh, I gotta get a job. So that's where life shows up. And my sponsor, who was, this is where my sponsor came in. That's like, it's okay, bro. Besides music, what else do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm a vet tech. He goes, there's a bunch of animal hospitals. We're gonna, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little one-on-one -on -one with a resume, just gonna go around. I've got it, I got a job. I got a job at two places. And I started working again. Eventually I, I was starting to take the steps and I realized the band that I was in, Amen, was really volatile. And I was like, yeah, this, I gotta leave this band. I gotta, I have to save my life. And so when I went to them and said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do these last two shows and then I'm out, the singer was like, oh, what band are you joining? Thinking I had got a different gig and I was all, I'm not joining another band, bro. I, I got to get out. I got to save my life. Yeah. And he was all, oh. And, um, and so I left the band and went back to work to, or to work as a vet tech. And I got to tell you, it was so nice to just be like, get up. I worked like four days a week, three to four days a week. And do the job, hang out with puppies and kitties, try to be nice to people, go to meetings. I went to two meetings a fucking day. You know, I just like did the things. We walked everywhere. Me and my sponsor walked everywhere. He didn't have, I, he didn't have a car, I didn't have a car. Mm -hmm. He had two years and I had 22 months. And, um, and we walked around, went to meetings and all this. I worked the steps, man. And then when I had 10 months clean and sober, I got a call from head PE. I played in so many bands, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a, you have a I'm hell a, of a resume. Yeah, I guess but so. That's interesting you talk about, you know, like, just leaving a band, it's it's kind of like, I see it as the abandonment of ego uh, along with the humbleness that needs to come in. It's just kind of like, you know, your opportunity to be of service. Like you said, your love of animals in there. And That's just, that was luck of the draw that I, that I was a vet tech I, already. Yeah. It's, it's my nature to, I yeah. love animals, I'm, I'm, you know. But life has a weird way of that happening. When I'm on that path, right. when I'm being true, when we're being true, to ourselves, how do I know when I'm being true to myself? Usually when it's not really that hard. Mm. Sure. Not when it's not that difficult, when I'm not trying to force. Now, of course, we have to work at things, but it's also like the thing that I'm doing, I'm either good at it or I like it or whatever. Like like my job with Rock to Recovery, yeah. this will, it's work, man. I'm yeah. dealing with addicts and alcoholics all day, every day, writing music with them. But I love this job, man, mm -hmm. and I'm meant to do this job, right? So thankfully, I've got to do a, you know go yeah. back to work now here's what i want to point out too because there's a thing that happens in 12-step work is like this whole god thing so here i was back in aa but really in AA for the first time ever mm. right and again i i qualify for na and crystal meth anonymous i keep it simple and just thankfully southern california is quite liberal about like you know 
what some people would call singleness of purpose, mm -hmm. meaning you have to you have to be alcoholic or addict. Right. We're quite loose when it comes to that. Um, and I try to honor any meeting that I'm at. If I'm at an NA meeting, I'll say, my name's Sonny and I'm an addict. If I'm at a CMA meeting, marijuana anonymous, I'll just, yeah. I'll roll with it. Mm -hmm. It's the same fucking thing, man. It, I, me trying to say that I'm only this addict, that's me. Like, you can say whatever you want. Anybody can say whatever they want. But for me, I honor the group that I'm speaking at or I don't go to the meeting. Mm -hmm. sure. And I don't insist that they allow me to go in there and say I'm an alcoholic when it's an NA meeting. They don't have to do that. That's not their job. That's an NA meeting, honor that. It's an AA meeting, honor that. Or don't go. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. don't have to go. Yeah. Yeah. Don't try to change it. Just go somewhere else. There's plenty of meetings, especially now with Zoom. There's, you can go to a meeting oh, yeah. in Timbuk fucking too. Yeah. So I come in and I'm like, fuck God, right? I was in Amen. We had a, we had these these shirts that were mock turtlenecks that had the priest collar tied into them, mm -hmm. and it literally said "fuck your prayers." And I was like, "Yeah, fuck God." It was gnarly, man. I was so mad and lost. So I come in and I'm like, "All right, dude, I'm willing to try whatever. I don't know. Fuck me. Yeah. Like whatever I think is not working." And so I didn't, my sponsor was very diligent about trying to help me, you know, find my concept. I would write things. He'd have me write things out, which it doesn't say to do that in the book, but it just says like, what about finding your own conception of God is what Ebby said to Bill in Bill's story. And also it says it in We Agnostics. As long as you have your concept, as long as it makes sense to you, yeah. right? And there's a part in there that I love on page 47 that says, when we speak to you of God, Unfortunately, it's on page 47, not page one. <laughs> but it says, we speak to you, God, we are referring to your own conception of God, whatever it is. Right. It says, please don't let any prejudice you may have against spiritual terms deter, deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. Hmm. This applies to other terms you'll read in this book, right? So whatever you see, capital G-O-D or him or whatever, like that was the shit where I was like, oh man. But then it was like, oh wait, what does it mean to me? I, I know what I don't believe. I don't like the angry yeah. him mm -hmm. pronouns. I don't want any pronouns. And I don't even call it they. I'm not calling God they either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It, I don't know, I can't. Oh, oh, uh, Michael Beckwith from um, Agape uh, says that um, there, there's a, a word that is the most commonly used word in place of God. And it, the word is something. Huh. Something told me I, you know, I reached out to something or right. something helped me, right? So something. The help, what well, the, the way it helped me, my sponsor now was, uh, you know, he just he would say the God I do business with, and somehow that just made sense to me. Love it. Yeah, that just made sense. To yeah, me. man. Because it it's makes like, sense. You know, I do. Do I enjoy going to church services? Yeah, there's some great people that, that I like it some sometimes too. Yeah, some amazing, beautiful knowledge. And but when it was that, dude, it's a God you do business with. I don't. I don't care. I if, have it's, to, if it's this awesome poster right here or whatever it is, but do business. Right, but I had to do action before I could do business gotcha. with this understanding. I I needed. Um, I couldn't, I'm a finite being. I can't, I couldn't create an infinite God. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and people talk about it has to be big or it has to, you know, there's a God. All you need to know is there's a God and you're not it. And it's like, nah, man, sorry. There's way more than that. Talk to me about atoms. Talk to me about quantum uh, technology. Talk to me. Sorry, man. Yeah. This, you sound like my grandfather. Yeah. You're just saying it. You're just, you just smoked crack and, and he didn't. So you're, so you saying, oh, you just got to know it. Sorry, man. It's not. I need more. I'm not saying that. And some people go, "Well, oh yeah, you're not it." And I'm like, "Excuse me. I never thought I was God. Pardon. I don't know if you did, but if you did, that's then you. Can, that's on you because I never thought I was God. Mm -hmm. I did, if you will, try to play God in a way, trying to control everything. Yeah. Right. Trying to do things that were beyond my capacity. Mm -hmm. But I never thought I was God. I was never like, oh, I'm God. <laughs> So that doesn't apply to me, man. Mm -hmm. Not every there's not a one size fits all. Even the twelve steps, when you take them, the twelve steps are this set of actions. But the person who's taking them, like if you have a bit, you're tall and lean. If there's a guy who's five three and stocky, you guys work out in the same way. It's not going to, or even like Bruce Lee said, like study different martial arts yeah. because a guy who's six five is not going to do well with Wing Chun. 
and a guy who's you know but you know brazilian jiu-jitsu for the small guy is going to work better than yeah. right almost then, where he came with the be water the fluidity right of it. find the way find the yeah be water my friend <laughs> right exactly and so um as i started taking these steps man and being open to being introduced to because that's what it says in the book the book the pr purpose of this book is to introduce you to a power greater than yourself it doesn't even say god until the steps power greater than yourself that will solve your problem it doesn't say problems it's this problem which is with the one singleness of purposes we're talking about alcoholism the condition of alcoholism so i take these steps and then and i actually get introduced i don't have to find god guess what god is not lost i was hmm. and am still at times hmm. so i took these steps and then these amazing things started happening different behaviors i started thinking about things differently my dog that same dog that you got to go but your dog can stay mm -hmm. he got sick i was working at an animal hospital they started to the, i worked at two animal hospitals at the time actually and he got pancreatitis he was a boxer he was so fit was like you know big old lips and <laughs> sweetest dog shay and we were doing these tests and he had pancreatitis and like you know it's pretty treatable man it's a serious condition but you yeah. give him iv fluids don't feed him for two or three days everything levels out mm -hmm. his wasn't leveling out man he wasn't and i had a team of doctors who looked at me and they were like we don't know why he's not getting better and my my heart dropped into my belly i was just like fuck my dog is gonna fucking die man i was at this animal hospital where i was working i went in the back room this, this like a back room this grooming area where this water and dirty shit, you know dog hair and cat hair i fell to my knees i wasn't even aware of this i fell to my knees i prayed to a god i never didn't never knew that i knew i didn't know didn't believe in even and i said please help him and i wept and i said please please help my dog man anything you would give me give to him i didn't know i was doing it you guys and i went back to work huh. next day his vitals start to get normal is about he gets he actually gets better mm. a couple weeks after that i'm sitting with my spot he's fine a couple weeks after that i'm sitting with my sponsor this and this is where my sponsor pulls it out he's trying to he's like what about this and that and i'm like you know nature and the tides and the cosmos and shit but it, nothing was like landing with me and i wasn't really like desperate to find god i was just like yeah let's talk about this shit mm -hmm. and then he goes hey how about this when shay was sick did you pray for him and i, and I went "Ooh, i did <laughs> And I realized, and I went, oh, my sh oh God, I did. And he goes, you're going to pray to the God that saved Shay. And I went, I know exactly where that is. Mm -hmm. Where it, it, whatever. Yeah. You know where it is? Right here. Uh -huh. In the, my heart, human heart. Uh -huh. In my love for this creature, this innocent, truly innocent creature, who, I, who had nothing but innocent love and pure joy in, in with me. To say unconditional love is to say that he was a boxer and he was a dog. Right. Like unconditional the love is unconditional by nature. If it's if there's conditions, it's affection. It's not love, right? <clears throat> or it's like whatever, right? Yeah. It's affection, infatuation. But I, I was like, I know where that is, and it was here. It's on the mountain too, and in the cosmos, and in the depths of the sea, and whatever. But it's here, and it's in your eyes, and it's in your love for your dog or your children, or mm -hmm. and me too, right? And so I was like, I know exactly where. So I started praying to that God, dude. And then, sure enough, like a week or two later, Shay got sick again, man. He was not getting better. A week later, he was skin and bones. <clears throat> we were going to take him in for an exploratory surgery the next day. I climbed in the cage with him, and I kissed his big, stupid face, his awesome lips, and I, I chewed on his face. I love this fucking dog. And I was like, thanks, man. Thank you for introducing me to God that I spell with a capital D. <laughs> my dog with a capital G and my dog with a capital D. I mean, uh, my God with a capital D and my dog with a capital G, mm -hmm. right? Literally, whoever created the word dog and God, thank you. <clears throat> that works for me. <laughs> I'm obsessed with my dog, so I, I'm totally, I really am. That's I am. almost need a, need a tissue one. He's usually yeah. the crier, but when it comes to animals, that's, oh, I'm obsessed with my dog. Yeah, it, it was a tough thing to travel because uh, he had uh, his dog at home, Lola. I love it. Yeah, we got a cat and a dog. I love cats too. Lola, it's Lola Holy. Hello, yeah, she's Lola. After the kinks. <laughs> yes, finally. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly who it was. Because I always do that. People say Lola, and they're like, "Well, I'm just, just, I like the name." Yes, it was after. The, that's exactly yeah. where we named her from. She's, she's hugging Mario. She's hugging her little teddy Il, bear right Mario. There. I'm obsessed mm. with this dog. I don't like coming to LA on these trips because I hate leaving her. She stays with my sister because she's a chihuahua. She didn't like anybody except me and my sister. <laughs> so that's why I'm just like, as long as my sister's there, then that's fine. But if my sister cannot watch her, then I'm not going. 
Word. I won't go. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'll stay home with her. Yeah. Because I won't have fun knowing that she's being watched by somebody she's terrified of. She's just miserable. I can't go have fun. I'm not a psychopath. <laughs> have fun psycho. while my dog's, you know, psycho. suffering. Her, I just but... won't go. Yeah. yeah. Well, man, there's wow. that thing. That's, I found I found it. Wow. And, you know, so in, it's in that purest form of, of dog, you mm-hmm. know, the, the, the consciousness, the behavior, the action. Not just the sentiment, mm-hmm. and I've never heard that. And the, well, the other thing you said that that moved me and kind of helped me with some of those maybe even negative bonds or toxic things was like you know where it'd be like somebody would tell me or me me even telling them like, well I love you but and it's like whoa no it's that's not love that's yeah. affection there's a condition to it yeah. and I didn't put anything on it until you said that so thank you for sharing that and I hope people picked up on that yeah man. Because that's still, I'm still learning boundaries and that part and, and uh, uh, definitely being the, you know, the people pleaser or something that's like, I don't know, your life is going to lead you to a better place. I don't, I, I don't have to, oh, you know, I can reach out, hey, how's it going? But I have a habit of like, here's information that worked for me. Here's it, you know, and it just. Do this, do know. this. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so maybe it's, you know, I I'm get still it. working through that too with my yeah, mom like I'm oh, like really? mom you should do therapy and she's like I don't need therapy I'm like yeah you do but then it's not good everyone yeah. can benefit from therapy yeah. everybody I agree with that and I, it's about finding the right therapy. exactly because yeah. there are wrong therapists for you yeah, there you know one that you love could suck for me and mm-hmm. vice versa so yes I, I 100% yeah. agree with that my therapist doesn't isn't sober and she's she has an understanding but that's not right. why I'm, I'm, that's not why I'm going to therapy right yeah. I, don't, I go to AA I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm clean and sober. I've recovered from alcoholism. Yeah. I'm going to her because I have trauma, sure. because I have anger, because I have fear, because I hate myself sometimes when I wake up in the morning. Those, that's why I'm in therapy. And I, I don't need my therapist to get me, to get me sober. Even right. after 19 years, you still struggle with that? I, I know I do. Yeah, man. I do. There's yeah, like man. times, you know, the, the revamping of the past, you know, and, and it's the more time I get to, you know, recalling a man, oh, Jesus, I treated that woman like a piece of meat. And you know, I was, you it know, comes up for someone else to fulfill me. Oh, and, buddy, you, you got know, way more coming so for you. It's like, <laughs> oh, I, you, I, you should read, you know, you should read some of my journal stuff, you know, thank goodness I have a woman that's just full of grace in my life now, but it's like, yeah, some of it that comes up. It's, We're human, bro. There's yeah. a guy called Bob Timmons who, if you ever read like, uh, scar tissue or heroin diaries or oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris Cornell he worked with Aerosmith this guy yeah. Bob Timmons was um, instrumental in helping these guys get sober back in the day and, and helping um, uh, yeah cause he worked with the crew just before oh you do know who Bob yeah, Timmons doc, is yeah Dr. Feelgood and yeah. yeah yeah yeah. Uh-huh, yeah yeah and he said to me one day man this is when I had I mean I had like four years I think he, he passed away when I had around five or six 2005 I think he passed away 2006 anyway um, like I was hating on myself one day I was like Bob piece of shit and he's like Sonny Sonny he goes bro the best we can hope for is to be human hmm. and he said that and I went oh man so I'm an alcoholic and I've been so clean and sober for 19 years does that mean that I don't have any problems <laughs> <laughs> no you know what it means I'm a normal person uh-huh. I'm, on, I'm normal I'm not a normal drinker mm. but I'm a normal person in fact in the big book it says about in the in the tenth step, it says about uh, living life and being able to actually have sanity return. Because mm-hmm. sanity returns when we take these steps and we get to step ten and continue to do this thing. If you know, if I do the stuff, the things that are said in the book, they happen for me. I don't always see them until I look back and go, "Oh, that was happening for me." But in step ten, it says, "For by this time, sanity will have returned." If we're tempted by alcohol or anything else, we recoil as if from a hot flame. Mm-hmm. So I can, someone can say, hey man, do you want a drink? And I go, no thanks. Probably that's what I probably said to you back yeah, then. Yeah. No thanks. Just like if they said, hey, do you want some some uh, half and half in your coffee? And I don't drink milk, so I go, no thanks. Mm-hmm. And I go, no, I'm vegan, I don't drink. Although, <laughs> some vegans do that. Uh, a lot of vegans <laughs> yeah, do that, yeah. Hey, do you know how you can find, you know, you know how to tell if somebody's vegan? No. <laughs> Uh-huh. Just wait like ten seconds; they'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> or does CrossFit? <laughs> yeah, we always that's the CrossFit other one. Vegans, boom! Right. That's exactly right, bro. That's the third one, bro. I did. What well, would be a third Yo, one? Good, we, no. we talked about it in the car. What oh, did shit. I say? Well, well what did Bitcoin. I said? I have what did you come up with? <laughs> oh yeah, sober. Crypto. Sober. Maybe sober. Oh okay, okay. Yeah, sober like, too. So it's like I'm a vegetarian or I'm a vegan. Gets worked in everything. I do CrossFit. Gets worked in. <laughs> 
I'm, I'm sober. I'm sober. Oh, it gets well, worked into everything. I don't drink. I think I've like, noticed oh, that man, too. My foot hurts. Yeah, I've my noticed. foot hurts, but not as bad when I was in my addiction. When I was in my addiction, I was just like, what the fuck? Where the fuck did that come from? What would, does that have to do with anything? Would you stuff something in your mouth? Or, the other thing I've seen it though is is when I have been in a setting and talking with a, like a social thing at someone's house. It happened, Jesus, what was this, a couple months ago? And we were talking about spirituality, our differences, in the, and, and, you know, Hey Carl, I don't remember the dude's name. He's like, oh, I'm an atheist. So atheists do point it out too. They will throw it out there. You That's know? true. That's they'll, true. They'll they do talk out. about it a lot as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting better about that though. I don't bring yeah. it up. As it's not like much. it's a bad thing. I'm glad you're sober. Right. You can talk about it. I, I, I don't care. But I, it, it, it gets brought up. Often. I think I do it with you you're because also, because that's I new, trust man. You. Under two years. Sure. And that's, I don't say like, will you shut up about it? No. It's like I embrace. I'm like, it. I'm it's glad a new no. way of life. Yeah. 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 Well, Absolutely. and I and, and I see trust. when I was when I when, sorry when we Go met, I, he didn't know because yeah, I didn't right, say it. Right. 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 Because I was, I it was just part of the, my deal. Yeah. Well, sure. and, and it, no. you know my assumption too, you know, being whatever twenty something I was. Rock and, and roll, baby. You, yeah, and and he, yeah. you know, you stepped in when we met. <laughs> <is> when you. <laughs> Slugs all over the mirror, <laughs> you know. But, but when you stepped in to, For you know, Seven Dust, yeah. like I had hung out with those guys. Ooh, Vince so had I. I. Vince, Vince, and I were were drinking. Oh, buddies Vinny, you hung out with the boss. Yeah. So I mean, that was a, like they did a show. It was when Seasons came out. We had a show for the radio station I was working at at the Catalyst in Santa Cruz. Him, me, and then a dude I worked with. We sat up, and Vinny pulled out the huge bottle of Grey Goose, and my buddy Ryan goes. Uh, I'll be the driver tonight, and we finished that fucking thing. And here's the sun coming up, you know. And Mikey, it was Vinny, with Throwdown. Yeah, and Vinny's Vinny from, from Seven Dust, the oh, bass player. Bass player. Gotcha. We met Vinny's. when I joined Seven Dust. When Clint Lowry left, I joined Seven Dust for three records, and then Clint came back. But uh, I had partied with them too, like Snot and Seven Dust. Oh, I'm sure. Toured together, and we were like, I rode when we toured one time. In fuck, it was funny. We toured. It was Seven Dust, Snot, and Head PE. Ultim that was 1997. Ultimately, mm -hmm. I played in all three of those bands at different times, obviously. Right. Uh, but with I would ride in Seven Dust bus more than I would ride with Snot. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was the guy who could find the. Uh, oh sure. The uh, yeah. booger sugar. The devil's yeah. dandruff. Yeah, the devil's dandruff. <laughs> but that was a lot of my first, you know, exposure so, to it. Yeah, so you're like this guy, part probably. Yeah, parties. that's what I just assumed. Yeah, you know, it's like oh, I've sat. Fair here assumption. And, and had drinks with. All the guys, you know, previously in the band and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But hey, shout out to Clint. I had to tell them like his ways too. I had to tell them like, don't you don't you guys don't have to worry. You can have booze on the bus if you're gonna smoke weed. Maybe just do it in the back. And so cigarettes and weed were in the back. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they had been trying to help Clint for a long time. Sure. And so they had actually been. And I'm sure Clint would talk about this. They would go out of their way to like dry bus and then <laughs> Clint would go to somebody else's bus and drink. Yeah. yeah. So when I joined the band, they had like some like, oh, the, oh God, another sober guy. This, uh, right, right. Or, you know, is he really sober? And so, but I really was. And then Clint got sober and then came back. Yeah. But I was like, y'all don't got it. You don't have to tell people I'm sober. You don't have to talk about it. Like, it's just, it's like, again, it's like saying, you know, I do CrossFit. Right, <laughs> right. Like, you don't got to bring it up. Right. You know, like people don't talk about their little intimate things or whatever lifestyles. Right. Unless it needs to be addressed, I was like, "You guys don't worry about me. Just act, act as if mm -hmm. y'all be adults. I'll take care of my shit. Yeah, right. right. I'm the one responsible for me staying sober or not. Y'all, no one else has to do it. My friends don't have to stop doing what they do. Like you don't have to stop. Right. I may choose to stay out of it, or man, you know, I'm gonna hang out because I, I I can hang out. Yeah. In fact, there was a couple times like we did a snot reunion in 2000. I think it was 2009. We played in uh in Vegas one night and I hung man I have, like I like hanging out I don't really gamble but I like hanging out mm -hmm. and having fun and so at the end of the night most people including my girl were hammered so I load my girl into the bunk everybody else is getting in the bunks and I realized the front the the door to the front lounge was open and the front lounge was empty and the door to the back lounge was open and the back lounge was lounge was empty everyone was in their bunk except for me and I was like I'm the hardcore <laughs> motherfucker here. I'm hardcore. In fact, one time with Seven Dust, we were open. It was my last tour with Seven Dust in Australia. We were opening for uh, for um, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah, uh, yeah. 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 Opening yeah. for Ozzy. And oh, Zach was on one in that one. Uh, and uh, so we were playing shows with Ozzy. So we opened for Ozzy at this arena in Sydney. And this guy that I know um, who used to be uh, well, I don't know if he still claims it, but this you know famous country artist who may or may not have been from Australia 
uh, talked about being sober at some point, yeah. and, and I would see him sometimes, and I was like, hey, I'm going to Sydney. He's like, you got to go to the Good Egg Cafe, bro. Go to that meeting, 7.30 a.m. on X, whatever day. And so we, I played opening for Ozzy one night. The next morning, I get up at 6.30 a.m., grab a coffee, and I know Sydney pretty well, the inner har- I mean, the harbor and shit like that. I've been there a few times, so I knew exactly where to walk, and I went to this place called The Rocks, and the Good Egg Cafe was there, and you go downstairs, and bro, it was so dope. It was, you know, you guys know that Australia was like a penal colony. Like yeah, Captain yeah, yeah, Cook yeah. was a monster, mm-hmm. killed brown people because they're whatever. And so, but they had these like, and it was like prison people that would go, you know, prisoners. And so there were bricks laid in this basement that had people's names in them from like huh. fucking 18, whatever. It was so, it was so cool. And so anytime somebody in that meeting would say, this is my home group, people, it was, it was at this place called The Rocks, which was the G'day Cafe in The Rocks, which was like this big granite slab that, that they first started to settle in back when the colonizers came. And so anytime you say this is my home group, they pound on the table and they go, solid foundation, solid as a rock. And they did that and I was like, oh, I want this to be my home group. <laughs> and so I asked, can, I be, can this be my home group too? And they went, solid foundation. <laughs> and so I'm walking back to the hotel and I'm thinking, those dudes, Bidney's probably still up drinking. Those guys are probably passed out until 2 p.m. I'm the one who's hardcore. Mm-hmm. That's not hardcore with the, what I was, it's like self-destruction, Yeah. but it's not hard, it's hardcore. Yeah. Discipline is way more hardcore than oblivion. This is true. Yeah. And it's a hard, Discipline over oblivion. It's a hard thing to acquire, but it can be done. And it's, all, it's, it's, you know, it's fundamental, like reading. Yeah, and I'm not bragging. I'm a no. fucking human, and I might be vegan, I but I'm not that. that but I'm thank you. I just want to make sure that you don't take. It. I'm, I might be vegan, but I don't, don't take it that yeah, way. I don't take that way. I don't eat. I'm not only always eat healthy. Right. I love ice cream, man. That's a <laughs> really good fatty ice cream by this company called Lu- Lewins. There's this pistachio and a mint chip. It's so fucking good, dude. I'll, I'm gonna eat a whole pint when I get home. Sometimes. The good kind mm-hmm. of ice, not like the yogurt stuff. No, the oat ice milk. cream, ice oat cream. milk, oat milk, oh. oat milk. Got you. Sorry, vegan. Yeah. It even says it. I don't think I knew they made it with oat milk. I'm sure they had ice cream that appealed to vegans, but I didn't know oat milk. Cashew milk, coconut milk. Oh yeah. Huh. Soy. I'm not into soy. Even almond. Yeah, I'm not I really. I like soy. I love almond milk. I'll do coconut. Have yeah. you done oat? I have not. Bro, I hate soy milk. Bro, step into the oat milk realm. I'll try. I'm down to try it. Out. Give it a try, yeah, yo. Right. I'll give it a try. I usually like usually like like coconut milk creamers. If I'm Me too. Coffee. But then I found this one called Sown. I think S O W N. Uh-huh. Bro. Because I would do this, the so delicious vanilla, French vanilla, uh, I'm sure this is really interesting, French vanilla um, <laughs> right. coffee creamer. And then my niece, who's vegan, uh, she was like, check this out, dude. And there's, it is oat milk, and it is so fucking creamy and yummy. <laughs> so I love coffee, too. I do, I do uh, a lot of caffeine. Uh, so, we've got to ask, like, how did you, you know, how'd you meet Wes, Rock to Recovery, oh my goodness. man? Well. And I'm pretty sure I've met him, but I'm pretty sure I was probably not of sound mind then. Potentially. Knowing me, backstage yeah. at shows. Right, so then, all right, so going back into the 90s, I was in Snot, when we started to play in Hollywood and get into, like, the, the more southern scene, because we were from Santa Barbara, L.A., and then we started to get dipped down into... Um, Orange County and stuff. So actually, when I first moved to Santa Barbara, I don't know if it was a month or two after I moved here, we went down to see Deftones mm. play at a place called um, shit. What was it? So it was in Long Beach, like bottom of the hill, or that's in San Francisco. Yeah, bottom of the hill. Yeah, I saw Denko Jones there. I did Fucking see. De- awesome I, we played with Deftones. Snot and played with Deftones there. That's awesome. I like to see Danko Jones at the bottom of the hill. At the God, he's amazing. A oh, foothill. Anyway. It's called the foothill. Foothill. Long yeah, Beach foothill. I know what you're about. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for going for that with me. So no, I, I actually know what you're you talking about. You know the place, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went there, and we went in, and there was 12 people, including us, the four or five of us that came. And the band that was opening for Deftones, who, at that point, Adrenaline wasn't out. Lynn had the demo and was playing. I was like, God damn, this band's fucking good, man. It was original uh, with Chino with the like real sad, sweet, sexy mm. vocals over the heavy guitars. I was like, oh, shit, okay. Like, that was new to me. I was like, damn. And we went, and this band was opening for Deftones called Head P.E., or it was called Head at the time. They didn't have the PE yet. And there's a rapper and there's a DJ who's doing sparks off the damn d- turntables and, and the guitar player's doing crazy whammy pedal shit. And I'm just like, oh my God, we got to go back to the fucking lab and get crazy. We got to get to work, y'all. Mm. And then Deftones came on and I was like, oh my God, what are we, oh, we, we got to go. We got to get to work, <laughs> right? And so I saw Head PE or Head before, I'm, obviously before I met him. 
And then it, we ended up ultimately both bands were doing well, and then we ended up playing shows together, and, and started becoming buddies. And then we, we paired nicely together, and so um, we would we would bring them up to Santa Barbara. They bring us to Orange County. This is how we did it, man. Back then was Santa Barbara. We would meet bands like System of a Down and Incubus, and I don't think we did it with Cold Chamber, but there was a band called Manhole, which is Terry B. Um, and then there was uh, like all these bands. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, including uh, uh, system, yeah, yeah. So we would we would trade shows, including head PE, right? We would just trade shows. Are you come to Santa Barbara, and we would sell people out. People come to Santa Barbara, and they were just like, "Oh my god, this is great! Smoking hot chicks everywhere, free <laughs> drinks, ecstasy." I mean, it was so rad, dude. Me and Darren uh, both did ecstasy one night. We played this tiny place. It was about as wide as this room, maybe twice as deep, called Alex's Cantina. And we were, I mean, literally on ecstasy playing. It was so killer. Anyway, that was that's when it worked. It, it wouldn't work that way anymore. It turned into me smoking meth and squatting in Hollywood, losing my teeth. So, um, and it would return to that. I mean, it's just yeah. not. It doesn't play happen. it out, Sonny, just right? Play it out. Just, just doesn't happen again like that. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> Where the fuck was I just? <laughs> we were, we were. I was talking about how you met Wes. Here. Wes, yeah. <laughs> so we were, we would trade shows, and then so when it came down to it, we every we all got record deals around the same time. We started touring, and um, System of a Down did it right. They held out. We jumped at like at deals. I mean, we got a good Geffen deal or whatever, but those guys did it right. They had a killer manager and still have a killer manager. Um, so and that's just another like, oh man, we were so desperate to just right. we're just gonna get in the van, and, and System was like, we want to have a career, and plus we're the most unique band pretty much that's ever come around yeah yeah like anybody sound like that no not before and people might try it now but it's like you're no. gonna fail yeah you know you can't try you can't do it so um i became buddies with them and we went on tour a few times and i would throw down we went on tour in europe together when i was in amen i would ride their bus and shit and just i mean just throw down so finally when it came down to it uh when i had 10 months sober i got a call from bc from head pe and he's like hey man What's your party? What's your party situation? Because we partied together. And I was like, I've been sober for ten months. He goes, Cool. You want to join Head PE? And I was all, Sure. And so I joined the band. Turns out Chad had left the band, the one guitar player, right. and Wes uh, was still there. And Wes and the singer were not on good terms, and that's why one of the reasons one of the reasons that the guitar player left, Chad. Um, and I came in all fucking clean and sober. And again, I could hang, man. Like this was ten months in, and I was like. You know, I was doing all right, man. I would, I'd, I'd set my boundaries if I needed to, but I really didn't need to. The singer, man, he would, he took over the back lounge as many singers do, which is kind of what, the, what they do. And I go, all right, you're the singer, you, whatever. We need you to be on point because you're the face of the band. So sure. do your thing. Your instruments in your body. So to a degree, you get, you, we're gonna let you do what you do. We need you to be awesome. Mm-hmm. I can tune my guitar and break, if I break a string, I change it. If you fuck up your voice, you can't. What you know? And so I'll give you some props. And so that dude was so cool, though, and he smoked weed, smoked weed every day. I mean, literally, Nate Dogg, Snoop style, smoked all the time. And he was so cool. I go, hey, Jared, man, you know, I'm sober, right? So every day I, I have a spiritual practice, man. So is it okay if I use the back lounge for like 30 minutes a day? And he's like, absolutely, man. And so he's like, just as long as I can get like 10 minutes to you know, get out. And I'm like, got it. And so each day, it was usually in the afternoon because we played late and I get up at 1 or whatever, eat some food and go... Hey, Jared. And he go cool. And he would bail out, do whatever. For, and all I needed was 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. I would read um, like three meditation books, um, day, like daily readers, like a Daily Reflections, which is based in AA, um, Emmett Fox, which was, I was doing contrary action because I didn't and still don't believe in the Christian God, although this Jesus guy interests me, the, the things that he said yeah. or that people say he said, and the stories of a that are told in some of the uh, more Eastern uh, doctrine or the more, uh, East, Eastern scriptures about a man who traveled over there who was from the, the West and meditated and shit, you know, maybe for 18 yeah. years and all this stuff. I don't know if you know anything about that stuff, but that interests me. And But I was doing what's called contrary action, so I was reading some Christian-based, uh, albeit a scientific view of Christianity with Emmett Fox. I was reading some of that stuff, and I had a Bible that I would read the Proverbs. Um, I would read whatever day of the month it was, I would read that chapter. Proverbs are rad, like a way of living. I'm mm-hmm. not sure if any, you know if you yeah. guys are familiar, but mm-hmm. it's rad. Um, and so, and that, and then there was another like 365 Dow. Like I had a Taoist book, and I'd read those, and I would meditate for 15, 20 minutes every day. And there's a bong right here, and there's a styrofoam cup with cigarette cigarettes in it, and uh, you know some and some beer cans over here. And I'm sitting there going, 
meditating for 20 minutes and you know i walked through the valley of the shadow of death i don't fear evil i wasn't afraid man mm -hmm. i was able to do it and i did it for uh 15 years my first 15 years of sobriety i toured yeah um there was a couple times where it was like yo <laughs> like when somebody was chopping lines up behind my head and i was like yo <laughs> do me a favor tell me you're gonna do that and i'll leave or get in the fucking back lounge yeah, yeah that was a couple buddies that i won't name them but they were i was like what the fuck are y'all doing chopping shit behind my head and they were like sorry man you know we're drunk i'm like cool uh, you are so go in the back lounge you yeah. dumb asses yeah. um that happened once and then um the only times there's been two times where i i was actually um i was actually like really uh probably close to drinking um and i was uh and i and i didn't really know until i went oh my god the first one was completely unconscious i had around three months sober i was on sunset strip right. i'd taken my girlfriend's sister to see a show because i had, had a hook up with the roxy and i didn't want to see the band so i walked her in and was like hey i'm gonna go to the hustler store and and um get a coffee <laughs> and get a coffee and look at magazines or whatever they have a very nice periodical section <laughs> i'm sure that's why you were there yeah it really was but they also have other things uh so uh, i went down there and i'm coming back up the hill and i see on the rocks the bar on top of the rocks and I, i'm like wait a minute melody's working tonight she'll totally I'll, i'm gonna go have a drink and then I went, oh shit, I'm sober. Like, oh, fuck. like I for, you know, yeah. forgot or, yeah. and I wasn't like, oh man, I want to drink. But I was like, oh, bing, I'm, hey, I'll yeah. go see the homegirl. And she'd been sober for years already, but she was a bartender. And so I was, and I was like, oh shit, I'm sober. Instead, I'll go and talk to her because she's sober. And so I went and hung out, hey, what's up? And talked to her for a few, went home. And then there was another time where I was uh, acting, um, acting out, uh, um, you could say, uh, against my true nature uh, i was not doing well on the road i was acting out with women and uh i was so clean and sober but i was not being uh, not uh, i'm trying to be as general as possible um i was fucking around on tour yeah. and i almost drank because of that sure. um, i'm so grateful that i didn't um but i was yeah i was on the, i was at a breaking point and i almost drank and i didn't i fucking called it off and like called my sponsor and was like dude i've been lying this whole time yeah. i gotta get honest and i got honest this is when i ever had around seven years and um i changed i was i was, I was literally was changed like i'm still that guy like i i'm single and i'm not trying to get as much i'm not trying to just go out and bone as many chicks. i want i actually want like real yeah. connection yeah. i've had some sex maybe more than some maybe less than others it, it wasn't you know like most of like 49 percent of it was amazing 51% was kind of like, oh, I could have done without that. <laughs> yeah, We were uh, That's ironically kind of having that conversation <laughs> on the way to, down here. It's and it like, could be 51, 49, depending on how, you know, it could go either way. Depends on the day. Yeah. Depends on the day. <laughs> so, yeah, so you go way back with Wes. With Wes, so, right, back so, yeah, to Wes. Yeah, so rock to Dude. recovery, man. And so I ended up playing with the head PE, and he actually was not sober. And... Um, I was still hanging with him. Like there were nights where he was on, was he was on blow and just was like yakking my ear off, and I would just be sitting there hanging out, or I'd go to bed if it was time to go to bed. Mm. And um, and he and the singer ultimately got in a in a pretty gnarly battle, and he left the band, mm. and then I was the only guitar player <clears throat> in the band for a while. Uh, ultimately, I did not like where the direction of the band was going, and I look currently see what the, Jared's been doing for the last few years, and I go <laughs> glad I did not stick around sure. for that excuse me um and so i left the band and i went back to work as a vet tech man and, then, and a, a few months after that uh i get a call from uh actually maybe about a year after that i get a call from morgan rose ja in fact it was january 19th my friend Whit crane's birthday of 2005 and uh morgan rose goes hey man <laughs> what's your party situation <laughs> Yeah, anybody who's seen any other podcasts with me, this is it's this is you'll hear this cuz this is my story. Yeah. Morgan's like, "What's your party?" I go, "Man, I've been sober for 3 years." He goes, "Cool, you want to join Seven Dust?" It's always a drummer, and they always ask me what my party situation is, and then they ask me to join the band. Um, and so I was like, "Yeah, sure, <laughs> sounds good, bro." Sent me the demos of the or the pre-production of the record that I was going to go start recording with them in 11 days. That was what next, right? It was next, yeah. yes. And uh, a list like a set list of the songs that they do, so Within 11 days, 12 days, uh, I was in Florida doing a record with Seven Dust um, in um, Orlando, or uh, yeah, uh, around Orlando. 
And that was killer, man. And now, to, to tie that in back with Wes, I stayed in touch with Wes because he ended up getting sober. And so we would stay in touch with each other. We were friends. You know, we'd stay in touch with each other. I was in Seven Dust doing records. I was going to meetings on tour. It was killer, man. I had a great time. Seven Dust, I mean, besides touring with Whitfield Crane of Ugly Kid Joe, who's my homie, who's like, God damn, I love that guy. I got to see the world with that dude. And he was actually, at the time, doing an experiment on himself where he was like, what would happen if I didn't drink or do coke or smoke cigarettes and exercise? And what happened was his band got back together, did a record, and he now has a band again. They're, yeah. not, they're not like killing the game, but they do records, they tour, they yeah. do, you know, and he gets to live his rad life, which, and I love that guy. But besides that, playing with Seven Dust was my favorite touring because those songs are, I'm built for that shit. It's so fun. It's, and Vinny was my was my partner in crime, especially on stage. Yeah. And Vinny's the one that partied the hardest, and I was clean and sober. And I'm I mean I'm probably closest now with Clint. I mean I sure. am not. It's not probably I am closest with Clint. You know the guy that I replaced and then replaced yeah, yeah, me. Yeah. Just ironic, or not. But uh, I loved touring with those guys, man. It was so fun, man. You know, jumping fucking eighteen feet in the air. And just, Best way I can put it to people that don't. It's like a fucking drum core that just ba 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 ba, and it yeah. just hits you. And when you go and see it, I remember the first time I saw them. Finally saw them live. Seasons album. I just got my first tattoo, and they opened with black, so that you know yeah. when that dun, 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 kicks in. So I got this huge sweaty dude grinded into oh. the tattoo on my shoulder, and it's like fuck it, I'm at seven dust. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. But that was great. I mean, shoot, I think I saw you play with them. Eight or nine times. Excellent. So you we, know. Were, we were firing on all cylinders right yeah. then too. Yeah, we were some great shows. We were killing it. Yeah, yeah, that was so fun. So um, after uh, after Clint came back, I went to school and blah blah blah. And Cl and Wes had gotten sober. Um, and let's see, I think he was in Corn in 2011, right? Touring with Corn. And now, um, uh, uh, you guys know who Tommy Vexed is? Yep. So Tommy had gotten. Tom, formerly Bad Wolves, right? He, yeah. Tommy had hit bottom <laughs> on my floor in Venice in 2009. So he was sober for a couple weeks, a couple years, excuse me. And I was sponsoring um, the drummer of In This Moment. So, and Tommy went on tour as to sing a song with In This Moment every night. It was a single they had mm -hmm. on this on this tour of uh, Music as a Weapon, yeah. Corn, Disturbed, Seven Dust, In This Moment. Mm -hmm. And so we had a bunch of sober cats on that tour. Wes, Clint, um, Tommy and the drummer of in this moment. It's Jeff Fab. He's now he plays for for Black Label Society. I'll just say his name. Jeff Fab. He's rad. Um, and so they would have meetings, and they would on on the road, and they would call me, and I'd they I'd, they'd put the phone on the table and have a have a meeting, and we call ourselves the SFG, the St. Francis Group. I have an SFG tattoo on my leg, because we would uh, do the St. Francis prayer at the end uh, of the end of the meeting. You guys know the St. Francis I prayer? I don't have it memorized. It's the one that's like. Uh, um, uh, God, make me an instrument of your peace. The way there's hatred, I might bring love. Where there's wrong, I can bring the spirit of forgiveness. The way there's discord, I may bring harmony. Where there's doubt, faith, despair, hope, shadows, light, sadness, joy, um, and on and on. It's a really rad formula, actually. It's like very scientific in my view. And so we called ourselves that. And so I stayed in touch with those guys. And then this is a fun story, too, because our buddy, uh, a year later, uh, our buddy Randy Bly was arrested in the Czech Republic. And so instead of going online and going, free Randy Bly and all this, fuck Chuck, we did a, what's called a gratitude list. So we did an e gratitude email chain and we included Randy's email in there. So we just sent 10 things every day that we were grateful for. So all these sober musicians, including Randy Bly. Lamb of God? Yeah. yeah. Lamb okay. of God. Sorry if anybody didn't know. Lamb of God singer. Um, and then when he finally got out of the fucking Czech prison, um, he got his email and he's like, good Lord, what's all this? And so we started an email chain for St. Francis Group, and we've added to it. There's other guys that I'll leave nameless who are in the group. And, um, and that's continuing to this day. We still that's do it, cool. and it's huge. And we, set, we have meetings. We have Zoom meetings together. And so I stayed in touch with Wes through that. Now, in the, in the uh, subsequent years, uh, I did join Ugly Kid Joe. I was uh, engineering and co-producing their, their like return EP called Stairway to Hell um, instead of... Uh, Highway to Hell or Stairway to Heaven? Heaven. Stairway to Hell, Mikey, very clever. <laughs> see what they did there? I see what you did there. <laughs> see, yeah. see what I see what you did. And I like it. So yeah, I, I was co-producing and engineering that, and Whit Crane's like, hey man, you should go on tour with us. Dave, the other guitar player, can't tour because he's a producer and uh, he's working. You should go. He said, don't sit in the studio and get fat. Come on the road with me and see the world. And I was like, okay. 
So in 2012, we went to Europe and did all these killer shows and saw him again out in the world. He would go to meetings with me. He's not an alcoholic, but he was on a little little yeah, vision yeah. quest. He'd go to meetings with me and like, and then he'd like talk about how hard he drank. He's like, "Am I one of you? Am I am I in the club?" And I'm like, "Sorry, dude, because yeah. you're not planning your next drink. You're not like right. obsessing on it. You're not white knuckling." And he's like, "Oh man, he's so funny like that." And so uh, I love that guy. And so. Uh, I stayed in touch with Wes, and then in 2013, or uh, yeah, early 13, man, my dog Buckley got cancer. Two with two or three weeks later, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. Um, t- like a month after that, Buckley died. My dog Buckley, who's my favorite creature in the world. A few months after that, my dad died of cancer, died from complications of cancer. In the midst of that, between those two deaths, Wes told me about this idea that he had. He's like, "Hey, man," because he had gotten. Um, uh, replaced by um, head yeah, came back in came corn, back in corn. Mm-hmm. and so he's like I got this idea bro rock to recovery and he said it and it was like a, a light bulb went off of my head you know, bing he's like we're gonna go in and um, uh, write songs with people in uh, treatment centers and mental health facilities and he's, we were specifically when he started the, the nonprofit on December 12th of 2012 so it's 12 12 12 which is kind of cool for 12 steppers we like that yeah, kind of yeah. shit mm. It was, for, it was really to work with veterans. That was his main idea. And then it blossomed from there. And he told me about it in May of 13. And I was like, bro, I want in. I have a journal entry. And I'm like, I want in, dude. Like, I want in. And he goes, all right, cool. I'm just starting. He hadn't even started his first group. He said, I'm starting next month. So I started shadowing him. And I was still touring and stuff and whatever. But I started shadowing him. And then eventually it grew. And then we got some LA, we got an LA client. And so I, I launched my rock re- first rock recovery session in May of 2014. And so if anyone doesn't know what Rock Recovery is, it's a nonprofit organization and a for-profit organization, two separate arms. And what we do on both sides is we, uh, we're group facilitators. So imagine I come into a treatment center, there's a group of six people, however many. I got a couple small guitar amps, combo amps. I got like a K10, which is like a powered monitor, 10 inch speaker, keyboard, plug it into the thing, microphone, plug it, some percussion. And I sit down, and we start a band together. It's not for musicians, it's for everyone. Hmm. And so, I've, I mean, I do groups with two people, like the three of us would sit here and we would write a song together. And you would play the bass on the keyboard. I don't know if you play any instruments anyway, but. I do not. Okay, no. but I would put you on bass on keyboard and write on the keys, mm-hmm. one, two, three, four. And we'd find a bass line, we'd find the style. I'd get you on lyrics and vocals and I'd play guitar, right? And we'd write a song together. And man, what, we, what happens in these groups is magical because everybody loves music. Everyone does. Yeah. It speaks to us, no matter how old, no matter what color, what gender, where we're from. It speaks to us all. It's the connection. It's the connective tissue. Is music. Uh, math might be the universal language, but uh, music is the mus- universal language of love. Mm. Right? The co- real connector, man. Right? And so we write songs with people, dude, and it's as a means of recovery. And we record the, the song in real time. We write it and record it right there. And then we upload them to SoundCloud. So we have a Rock to Recovery page on SoundCloud. We have over 21,000 songs nice. that That's we've cool. done since 2013. Nice. Yeah, really man. Cool. It's incredible. During the pandemic, we opened up the virtual uh, realm, and so uh, it's more of a digital production kind of thing. There's a, a website called Soundtrap that we use that has a killer loops library. Like, if we were remote, you, we could meet in Soundtrap and write and record a song in there. I, I, use, I do that yeah. mostly with teens. That's um, cool. But we work with Air Force Wounded Warriors. We work with the... Uh, Semper Fi and America's Fund, so we do a lot of work with veterans. We work at the VA. These are mostly donated groups that we do um, because we are a nonprofit, so you can donate to us at www.rocktorecovery.org. And we do this work, man. It's fantastic. I love it. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was curious because we definitely wanted to know more about it and maybe get get involved and everything else. So I told you guys I was a talker. Yeah. So we started it off, and I was like, you're all... (laughs) Rock to recovery. Well, yeah, I did a. a uh, I got flown to to um, Atlanta right before the pandemic, a couple months before the pandemic, <clears throat> by this guy called um, Scott Bowling. He has a show called Good Company on YouTube. Okay. And he, so he flew me out there, and I was like, "Bro, I'm a talker. So can we start off with Rock to Recovery? Can we start with that?" And he's all, "Sure." So we so, so we started with it because I wanted to because I'll get going like I right. did, and I'm like, "Oh yeah, Rock to Recovery." Oh yeah, time is up. So Rock to Recovery. How long yeah. is it? It's been three hours, Sonny. Jesus. Oh Sorry. shit. No, it's all good, man. I don't well. know if it's a gift, but I got the gab. Hey. <laughs> and so today, man, 
what I'd like to share too is the stuff we talked about with like long term recovery puts us in a position where we're we're human mm -hmm. and I need therapy I, I want therapy right and especially I, it really happened when I when the pandemic hit because I have coronary artery disease I didn't even talk about the heart attacks that I've had mm -hmm. with you guys and how like through that through the, that experience with with heart attacks you know my my um, my uh, spirituality may have deepened but also my anxiety and depression mm -hmm. just exploded mm -hmm. yeah. I'm broken man yeah. like I'm you know that those thoughts and so when the pandemic hit I have five stents so when the pandemic hit, I was my doctors were like, "Don't go around people, right?" I feel completely comfortable now. I think if I got COVID now, I would whip its ass. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, and I'm, I got the vaccine and all the shit, and I, you know, be, make sensible choices. And I imagine you guys do too. So mm -hmm. whatever. Um, so um, I was locked down, man, and I was at a point where I was going out of my fucking skin. And a colleague of mine, friend of mine uh, from Rock Recovery, was like, "Hey, uh, you seem really edgy." Are you okay? And I was like, no, I'm not okay. And she said, how about, would you consider therapy? And I said, yeah, but I've checked into some and I, I don't like who I've, I'm not, the traditional talk therapies doesn't, I'm not, it doesn't resonate for me. I got a sponsor, I got connections with other alcoholics, men that I, I, I don't hold back, but I don't have the, I don't have something to use besides the 12 steps. And the 12 steps do not claim to solve all of your problems. Mm -hmm. It puts us in a different realm, but we're still human. It doesn't claim that shit. So I don't put it on AA to fix everything. People go, oh yeah, it's good for all. I'm like, okay, but it's not for me. Yeah. But I swear by it for my alcoholism and recovery. So she was like, what about this therapist who I had actually done a session with her? Um, I went to a session with my friend as the male, as a representation of men, because she had trauma around men. Mm -hmm. And I went there and I was like, I played the role of like a protector of her. She was molested by her dad. Mm. And so I, protected her and I like beat this hit this cube and shit and I got to connect with this her therapist and so she's like what about this therapist and I was all oh my god I'd love to and I've been doing therapy with her since May of 20 and it's changed my life that's awesome brought up some really gnarly shit oh and, yeah but changed my life and I have tools to use that are in conjunction with what I, all the tools I have for recovery but there's more to it it's different yeah it's yeah. It's, it's another realm yeah, yeah. and it's uh, it's another, I find it's another it martial art it's like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and boxing. Totally different. But I, th I find it necessary. Absolutely. I find it necessary. Yeah, and they mix, they mix well, they go together. Yeah. Compliment. And it creates, like you said, being human, it creates more of who and what you are. It's like your style of living and conducting yourself. It's none of this shit is one size fits yeah, all. Yeah, man. What's your style? Yeah. The art of fighting without fighting. <laughs> I agree, man. I, I think it's for everybody. Like I said earlier, like I feel like mm -hmm. everybody would get something as long as you're with the right therapist. Because mm -hmm. there is wrong ones, but if you're with the right one, yeah, yeah you absolutely could. Yeah, there's ones that are wrong for you, and then there's just shitty therapists. But That's the caveat, yeah. We ain't calling nobody out. Uh, well, I think we'll just have to do a part two because otherwise we'll sit and I go know, all day. But uh, Sorry, not sorry. You, you, yeah, you listen to the podcast. You know we do some fun random yeah. questions. So. Oh, oh, fun random questions. Well, oh, you yeah. get the random questions. Oh boy. Mike, you're up first. If they were to make a movie about you, who would you cast to play yourself? What age, though? There's different ages, right? Right now. Uh, we'll just do it right now. Because I've been getting that question a lot, and I haven't thought it from, through, so we'll do that. Uh, it's the guy from um, Breaking Bad, Jesse. Oh, yeah. Um, why am I drawing a Is name? he on Alpha Dog as well? Uh, yeah. Is he? Why can't I oh, remember here. his name? He's the older brother from Alpha Dog. It is Aaron. Aaron Paul. Is he Aaron. on Alpha Dog? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, let's look. Because I haven't seen Breaking Bad, but I want to say that's the same guy. I didn't watch Breaking Bad either. Aaron Paul. Yep, that's I him. can see it. Yeah. I how, can see How old Aaron is Paul. he? 79? That's close enough. Close enough. Because I, yeah. I don't look like 44? 40, 42. 42. I'm 50. There you go. The 42 year old can play me right now. Thanks for yeah. that's a great question. Yeah. Because people go, you know, you remind me of him all Jesse from Breaking Bad. They're like, yeah, how'd you know? <laughs> hey, Pink Pin. Aaron Paul. <laughs> Next time I text you, if I. If I need to check in with someone or something, I'll just, hey, Pinkman, what the fuck's going oh, on? Oh, yeah, Pinkman. <laughs> that was his name, Jesse Pinkman? Yeah, Jesse yeah. Pinkman. Uh -huh. uh, okay, uh, you're stuck on a deserted island. Some reason, you have the ability to watch uh, movies and listen to music, but you okay. only get one movie and one album. Okay. What are they? All right. One movie, All right. one Fight music Club. album. Okay. I just, I got it, because there's, there's a bunch, right? I'm just going to say it, yeah. but I'm not going to go, and if it wasn't that, it would be, but I'm just going to yeah. give that one, Fight Club. And then an album. Oh, God. 
I don't know. Oh. That's so easy for a musician, right? Yeah. They're influenced by so much different so stuff. So easy? Oh, man. Let's say... Um, We've let people cheat with compilations before. <laughs> <laughs> but it would, I'd need different genres. I don't know if there's right. compilations of different genres. Maybe... Um, oh, I want to go with... Uh, no, Wish You Were Here, Pink Floyd. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know you were a Floyd fan. Yeah, I love David Gilmour, yeah. I didn't know. And I wouldn't... I couldn't have just heavy. I couldn't... I'd have to... I'd have to have something dynamic, yeah. and that go, that gets heavy in the way Pink Floyd does, but it's not. Yeah, you know. I got more of a serious question. Oh, shit, okay. um, would you rather fight one horse-sized chicken or ten chicken-sized horses? <laughs> Wait, okay. Horse-sized. Make sure a horse-sized chicken, chicken, or that's a serious question. It's as serious I as it gets, bro. It's real too, because the real. chicken can fuck you up. The horse-sized chicken. I would probably fight the chicken. Really? I think there's. I think they're stupid. I think I could figure it out. But the little, but the horses are smart. I know, yeah. and they're ten. There's ten of them. There's ten, so yeah. if you, they get you on the ground, you're fucked. And they've got they got things. Yeah. I mean, they don't have claws, but they have the, the, the hooves. They got the, 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 the hooves. Hooves. The hooves. The hooves. What do you call it? A hoof. Yeah. Remember in uh, remember Goodfellas? <laughs> right. Oh like, yeah. Hey, he got his. Uh, what was it? Like a paw? Or what do we hit a deer? <laughs> This is stuck in the wood. Hey, is it a hoof? Hey, <laughs> hoof? Penny, looks like somebody we know. Hey, 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 hey. This guy's looking this way. This guy's looking that way. This guy's like, hey, what do you want from me? <laughs> yeah, what do you want from me? Yeah. I did an Instagram post like that. I was sitting and I had my dog who was kind of looking that way and my friend's Rottweiler looking that way. And I was looking at the camera and then I did the, uh, and I saw I did my picture and then that, that the painting. The caption, yeah. And I, put, I had to put the, the dialogue there. Uh, I like this. Sure. I like this. You know why? Look at the other way and it's like, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? What do you want from me? Oh, shit. Uh, last random question. If you could have have any one superpower what would it be all right so i i asked this question in, in rock to recovery sometimes oh i, I need help with it because it's one power right i have yeah. one power one yeah. so the, the power is that i go like this and touch someone and they realize the things that they do that are cruel oh. they realize their cruelty and they go oh my god i'm gonna i'm gonna stop doing that mm. the reason that i want that and I need some. I need some. Maybe like somebody that has teleportation powers. Is that yours? That was mine. Oh, great! Then you can help. I me. thought you were going the route that he said because he was saying healing. Mine would be healing, like healing other people, not myself. But Which no. would make me feel like a dick because I just want to teleport. I want to avoid airports and all that. But you I'm can, in New York. I'm in Texas. Well, then how you pay it? Pay it. Pay it forward is. You teleport us to heal people. Yeah. And then I help people who are go. cruel, like. People in dog fa factories where they kill and eat dogs. Oh, dude, I'm on wet, board with. I'll go with you markets. for that. Yeah. yeah. So you, I need you to teleport me, and I can walk over and go, "Hey, man," and they go, "Oh my god, oh, what have I done? Stop, everyone, stop killing, stop doing." I don't think it'd be that yeah. calm if I went there. That's my thing. Yeah. I just want them to stop. Oh, I don't, yeah. No. I don't want to kill them. I feel you. I don't want to do what they're doing. I want to just. I want them to stop. Yeah. My hero is a guy called Mark Ching. You guys ever heard of that guy? Mm -mm. Veterinarian, uh, Chinese American. He's American, Chinese descent. Um, but he would go. He doesn't do it anymore. Um, he would go to. Uh, uh, it's called the Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. He would go to these countries, and pose as a dog meat buyer. Huh. And he would and he would infiltrate and he would buy dogs just to get them to fuck. Oh, that's out of awesome. There. So wow. he went into literally hell. Now think about hell, people. It's this pl this imaginary place where if I, I don't know, kill myself, I go there forever and am tortured and ripped apart and burned and frozen and to all the things and whatever. Well, this guy went to that hell for dogs where they were thrown into boiling vats of, of oil and water and, 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 just, and they had their arms cut off while their legs cut off while they're still alive. This, this is happening right now. At this moment, this is happening. That guy would go there and do that. And he did it so many times and he brought all these dogs back and he was tortured, man. And he has wife and kids. And sometimes you go in there and these guys are demons. Mm -hmm. and, and like he would be posing and like he got into some sketchy shit where the guns were pulled on him and, and all this other stuff. And so that dude's my fucking hero. What man. country is this in? All kinds. He went to Cambodia. He went to China. He went to uh, all, these, all these, you know, mostly, sadly, Asian countries. Yeah. But that's where they, you know, they eat dogs but I would also do it I would do it in America I would go to a factory farm where, they, where they're electrocuting pigs and they're shoving pigs I'd go over and go hey man and the dude would be like fuck I'd go right downtown LA Uncle John's mm. or uh, 
Farmer John's, you know, and I would just go, hey, dude. And they would see the, that pigs are sentient beings. They love their, their kids. They don't, they know exactly what's coming. The cow knows exactly what's fucking going on. The that's reason, what I always said. There's yeah. those animals are smart and they know what's happening. Of course, and they're all smart. that. That's why. That's my reasoning on not eating meat. Yeah, it's right there. It's just sympathy for animals. Well, I ate I'm a shit ton dick. of. Well, don't worry about that. I ate a shit ton of my first forty-two years of my life. I was a. I, I wasn't. I'm not a carnivore. No human is a carnivore. That because that means you only eat right. meat, mm-hmm. and that means that you have razor sharp teeth in the back. And you have not just these canines. What am I going to kill with these? Hmm. I have canines. Okay, go kill something by biting its neck and then eat it right then and there. Yeah. Go kill an antelope, buddy. Do it. And then I'll, I'll give you the props for a carnivore. You went to Vaughn's and got a tri-tip that some dickhead chopped up and ki- had killed and chopped up. You're not a fucking... I'm not impressed. Yeah. I did that shit. I used to say animals... I love animals. They taste great. I used to say that shit. Bacon tastes good. All that bullshit, man. And I hit bottom with that. And that was around my dad dying, actually. Mm -hmm. I was literally going to see my dad die in the ICU. And I had a fucking spiritual awakening opening a menu. And I went, I'm not eating meat. It was like somebody touched me and went, you're not eating meat. I went, I'm not eating meat. And it was over. It was weird and rad. But for 42 years, I ate bacon wrapped everything. Deep fried fucking everything. And so... um, yeah, man, that's what I would do. I would go to these. I'd go right downtown. I'd just go, "Hey, bro," and people would see the the how they're cruel, and they would stop mm. doing it. I had a, the biggest spiritual awakening I've ever had. I was at the Gentle Barn, in um in uh, uh, it's out in the fucking desert in L.A. Um, Canyon Country, and I walked into this, and I was vegan at the time. I was yeah, I was vegan um, a couple years at the time, but I walked into this barn and it's a uh, farms it's a sanctuary for um rescued farm animals there's a bunch of them and they're fantastic all of them. Mm. gentle barn i walk in and i look over and there's a cow the size of the, that bed it's three thousand pounds and he can't get up because he's been genetically bred i look over you guys i have never in my life felt like i was in the physical presence of god i don't care how that sounds to anybody i do not care how that sounds I'm not Hindu, but maybe I am. A sacred cow. Huh? Maybe so, man. But I walked after eating all of his friends. I saw that cow and I went, oh, and I and he was called Gentle Ben. And I went over to this cow, you guys, and it was places full of people, and cows. And I fell on this cow and I hugged him and I wept, and I said, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry." I mean, out loud, like weeping, saying, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry." And I, sw- I kid you not, he leaned into me, and I wept and I sobbed and I was and I and I got up. People were just like smiling at me and I went like this and I like wiped it on my heart and I was like all right man and I went about the day and I hung out with goats and chickens and a turkey gave me a hug and shit and then at the end of the night or the end of the day I saw the owner the the founder her name is Ellie Lax and she and I was like Ellie I gotta tell you this story and I told her what happened Hmm. and she's looking at me and she was like oh honey you needed some forgiveness he forgives you you're forgiven. Hmm. That fucking cow forgave me for eating all of his friends. For all, literally, I was like, I'm sorry for every single thing that I've done. That, and I knew that I was doing it. I knew it was wrong or whatever, and I did it. And I'm not trying to. You don't got to be. You don't got to be. Nobody has to. This is my experience. Mm-hmm. But I sure would like to touch people and, and have them go. Yeah, I'm not gonna do that anymore. Now, if I was on a deserted island, yes, I would eat meat. You fucking idiots. <laughs> How about this is my question to people when they go, if you were on a desert island, you had to eat meat, would you? Yes. Mm. Now, if you were in an advanced in an advanced civilization where no animal ever had to suffer to be murdered by another person so that you could get nutrition, would you eat an animal? Do you understand the question? I do. Yeah. Would you? Because in that civilization yeah i'm not on a deserted island but you're in a civilization where no <laughs> animal has to suffer i did not turn the, know this was going to turn into a vegan rant <laughs> sorry guys sorry about that you don't have to be vegan i'm just saying it's best for me <laughs> and you know every now and then i do eat like uh, uh my friends got an organic my friends have a farm uh-huh. and i saw the ducks and i saw the chickens and my friends like yeah those are the and i'm like i would probably eat something with those those chicken or duck eggs and so he made a frittata 
mm. and I ate a little wedger for. It's not a religion for me. Right, right, right. It's not a religion. It was a spiritual thing at first, but it's not a religion. That's why when you said, "Oh, you're a vegan," I said, "No, no, I am vegan. Uh -huh. I'm not a vegan." <laughs> because right. then it's like, well, what kind of vegan? There's raw vegan. Blah, blah, blah. Sure, sure. Like sure, I sure. do honey, and I, yeah, yeah, like. Fuck off! I'm not. I'm just really what I am. It's is, what you are. That's what you are. It's a conscientious you are you. omnivore. Yeah, there you go. I'm a con. I eat whatever I want to eat whenever I want to eat it. Sure. You can't eat that. Yes, I can. I'm just choosing not to. That's why I get the question. You too, can't like drink. Yes, I can. I'm just not gonna. They're yeah. like all. Uh, oh, Mikey, there's nothing here. You, there's something you can't eat that, huh? I'm like. Well, I mean, I yes, I can eat it. I just am deciding not to. Yeah. For the past, I have the ability the to consume years. said thing. You I could eat, eat that fucking uh, pillow over there if I wanted to, but deep, deep I'm not going to do it. Deep fried, deep I might fried. taste it. Oh, you can't eat uh, that. That's just my favorite thing. Is oh crap, you can't eat that. It's like yeah, no, I can. I'm yeah. just not. It's only been about 15 years, so I'm still getting used to it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. All right, you won't eat it. We uh, oh, wait. One more thing. One more. Go ahead. You know, I have one more. Go ahead. People say. Go ahead. Drinking's not an option today. Just like eating meat's an option today. I am over 21 years old. I have enough money in my pocket where I can go and buy alcohol. It is an option. Right. Yeah. I, thankfully, today, have been given the power of choice. I can choose not to drink and use today. That is recovered. I have been restored to sanity where I go, hmm, do I want to stab myself in the eye with this pen? No. Do I want to drink that or smoke that? No. Right. Choice. I was going to ask you for the words of inspiration to close it out. Did yeah. I just give it and to you? You just That's did. Pretty <laughs> That's pretty good. That was perfect. Uh, cool. I thought you were like, we're done. You are like, here's one more. Any words of inspiration? There you go. Yeah. Recovery. It's possible, man. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs>